hit? Well, you know, it's always a question, What? how effective are sanctions? Do they actually change behavior? And there's not, you know, sort of a mixed bag on that, and we don't quite know. But these were fairly sweeping sanctions. Not only did they expel 10 individuals, not only did they pass these sanctions on 32 entities and individuals, but they also impacted American financial institutions. So the idea is to really hit Vladimir Putin where he is in terms of his ability to get the resources he needs to continue to run this government. Because let's not forget, Russia is at this point Vladimir Putin. So I do think these are sanctions that are pretty sweeping, but they didn't they didn't do anything about Nord Stream, nor did we decide to send those ships, those battleships into the Black Sea. So it was measured to that extent. And again, some people saying they're not as hard hitting as they might have been. So I do think it is a carrot stick approach because at the same time, he was hitting Russia with these sanctions. He also called Vladimir Putin this week and he offered a meeting particularly to focus on climate change this summer in a third country. That is something Putin will want to do, whether he in fact does it, we're not sure he's going to do it yet. But I do think we say, see Joe Biden saying, if you want to deal, we will deal with you. Climate change, we must deal with you on. But if you're going to attack, whether it's solar winds, whether it's the elections of 16 or 20, we are going to respond in kind. One thing that you said, Jeannie, really sticks out to me, that Joe Biden, the foreign policy president, President is very different than Joe Biden, the domestic policy president. Can you elaborate? Yeah, it's this dichotomy, Lisa, I, I'm just seeing. I, I wasn't expected for me. On the campaign trail, at least, uh, you know, I think both domestically and from a foreign policy perspective, this was a measured, moderate candidate. This was somebody who said, I'm not going to go as far as you know, somebody like an Elizabeth Warren or somebody like a Bernie Sanders when it comes to a government takeover of health care, for instance. And yet in the first 85 days, we have seen these proposals for massive spending and not just massive spending, but a massive re-engineering of the domestic economy, of our way of life. Now, whether he in fact succeeds in that, we're not clear on that. And it's more than just the proposals and the cost. It's the fact that he's somebody who ran as a bipartisan leader, somebody who was going to yeah. work across the aisle. He has not done that so far. He says he's going to, but even moderate Republicans are starting to say that seems a lot more symbolic than it does actual. So that's sort of the dichotomy. I'm seeing this much more moderate measured foreign policy approach versus this domestic, I am going to be the next FDR, LBJ, and re-engineer the way we do business in the United States, where government is much more assertive than it has been, at least in the last, say, three or four decades. They've moved the goalposts big time. Jeannie, it's great to catch up, as always. Come back soon. Jeannie Zaino there, our contributor here at Bloomberg. Lisa, I think that has been the issue down in D.C. for many people. The goalposts have moved. This was about uniting Congress, and now it seems to be about uniting the country for the United States of America, for this president. And I find that fascinating because the margins he has in Congress are so small for this party right now. In the House, it's a handful of seats. In the Senate, it's a 50-50 split. Do they have a mandate to make this kind of changes that Jeannie was talking about over the last couple of minutes? Yeah, and how large is that window of this feeling that we're not worried about deficits, we can just keep spending? It seems to be closing really quickly as the economy heats back up, which will create more headwinds for him and getting his plan through the uh, through the uh, finish line. And coming up on this program, Chris Morangi of Gabelli Funds. Looking forward to that conversation with all-time highs in the equity market. 41.65 on the S&P 500 from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Closing out the week with equities higher. This is Bloomberg.
generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2-neutral uh, mobility, so we have flicked the switch there, and really, uh, we're going to step-by-step step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, we're almost there. I'm struggling to get my words out. It's been a long week, hasn't it? Equity futures on the S&P 500, up three points on the S&P. We advance one-tenth of one percent. The Nasdaq declining, but a big week of gains in our performance versus the small caps, defining the week once again. The surprise of the week for some of you in the bond market, two's tens, thirties. Yields looking like this on tens, unchanged at 157.45 on thirties, 226. On a two-year, at around about 16 basis points or so. The surprise has been Better than expected retail sales, treasuries, yields lower. The story on CPI higher than expected, treasuries rally, yields lower. Really not much has changed. It's the tug of war between the cyclical factor and the secular factor. And Steve Major of HSBC has been all over of that. 157.45. Let's finish on this in the FX market. So we've got a high bar for U.S. growth. How many times have we talked about this over the last couple of weeks? What about Europe? What are the sources of upside surprises for the year ahead? Does it come from abroad? Euro dollar right now, 119.81. We appreciate by about a tenth of 1% in the euro's favor. Lisa, that's going to be the discussion for the weeks ahead. Can Europe start to deliver some growth? And will we start to look abroad? elsewhere outside the United States for those growth surprises in the coming months. That's definitely the story. Kit Jukes of Societe Generale is saying that that could be the next leg of where the trade is. Right now, let's turn to another region which has been in the news, which is China. We got some GDP data as well as other economic figures out of the region overnight. Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent N. Curran joining us now. And uh, how good were these figures? I mean, people are talking about China now growing well beyond the 6% target that they themselves forecast for the year. Yeah, Lisa, no doubt good on a headline basis. Like you said, record growth in the first quarter from a year ago. We're seeing the monthly data heading in the right direction, strong reading for retail sales, for example, and a pickup in private investment, which is very important. But there's no doubt when you look under the bonnet, when you consider there's base effects going on, we're comparing this to a year ago when the economy was shut down, we actually saw quarter on quarter a slowdown in China's economy. And there's some discussion now that maybe the industrial side of the economy is starting to plateau or cool down a little bit. So, look, it's a robust reading, still very strong headline growth, V-shaped recovery for China, but at the same time, some signs perhaps that it might be uh, cooling down a little bit over the months ahead. And can we talk about what on earth has been going on in the bond market over in Asia and in China specifically? Well, look, Huarong is one of the big bad bank managers here, John. As you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty this week as to whether it would make repayments on its bonds, whether there was a big restructure coming on that or not. There was a silence from Beijing, and that silence, the void was filled by the markets. But we are getting some clarity now at the end of the week. Huarong, for example, will make a payment on its next bond that's due. And the regulators in Beijing today, in fact, were sending some signals out that they're on top of this. Uh, Huarong's on track, and they will uh, publish its financials in due course. But still a lot of questions. It's still a big dollar borrower, John. And I think that the Huarong story, Ed, it's got a way to play out yet over the coming weeks, I think. I think a lot of people feel the same way. It's good to catch up. And the current there, out of Hong Kong, our Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. It has been a tremendous week in the market. Finbar Flynn pointing out this morning on Bloomberg News, Lisa, Europe having one of the busiest weeks of bond sales since the middle of March. We had JP Morgan with the largest bank deal ever. And in Asia, we've had some pretty robust issuance as well, even though we've had these big concerns around an issuer out of China. It's been an amazing week. And can we just sit on the JP Morgan news for a second? Sure. They're selling the biggest ever sale of bank debt in the United States. This comes after they've been talking about how much cash they have on their books, which raises a question, why? It's general corporate purposes. Some people saying it's because of regulatory issues uh, and, and what kind of capital they have. But it's a very strange kind of issuance based on the conversation on 
cash holdings. Shanani Bassett pushing the regulatory issue as well, and I think she's going to join us a little bit later ahead of Morgan Stanley numbers, which should come, I say should come, in about 60 minutes' time. Though, as I said at the top of the hour, we have Bank of America come out a little bit early, Goldman a little bit early, so Moving our eyes are looking out for Morgan Stanley, the final big bank on Wall Street to report earnings a little bit later. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, he is on time, Chris Morangi, Gabelli Fund's co-chief investment officer. Chris, good to catch up, sir. Let's start with the banks, because we've seen some really, really great numbers and some stellar execution from the likes of Goldman Sachs in the first quarter. Have you enjoyed what you've heard so far from the financials in America? Absolutely. You know, this was largely expected, um, which is why the stocks didn't do a whole lot uh, as a result of the earnings. But you've got this combination of very strong M&A, trading revenue, a reawakened consumer, which is, which is helping credit card balances, credit charge-offs, which are not as bad as expected, and the prospect of a lighter regulatory touch, all combining to uh, drive earnings and, and probably the multiple higher. And Chris, you'd appreciate where the conversation's at for the broader equity market right now. It's very much still the value versus growth story, which we've been anticipating for the last six months or so, that value could actually have a good run here. Do you still think there is runway for that story to continue outperforming value versus growth? I, I do, and I, I should note that uh, value's taken a little bit of a pause, and yep. uh, as well as small cap over the last month or so as some of the FANG names have, have come back. That's a partly in anticipation of very strong uh, fundamentals, strong digital advertising revenue. Um, but the market looks up, uh, more balanced uh, than it did, call it nine months ago, where the discrepancy between growth and value was as wide as it's been really since the 20s. Um, but I still think this value rotation has legs to be led by cyclicals, to be led by what we call the bottle stocks, banks, oil, travel, and leisure. And I think small cap has a way to go as well. Chris, John started this show saying, is this as good as it gets? And that has been the tenor of conversations, so particularly in the bond market. Yet you see this growth ongoing, this momentum continuing. What are people getting wrong who are buying bonds right now and saying, perhaps this is as good as it gets? Yeah, not to be too cute, but what worries me is that nobody seems to be, at least in the equity market, worried about anything. It's very hard to see what takes the economy down. We, you know, There's the usual list of, of suspects. Um, but you know, I think we could go, I, th I think the, the economy in the U.S. is going to be a lot stronger than anticipated, perhaps in Europe eventually. And I think this market's going to go a lot higher. And then we start to think about 2022 and the risks of inflation, the risks of tougher comps then, politics comes back. But that's a ways off. So the next few months, I think it's probably clear sailing. It's hard to know what what we're missing. Higher inflation. You say that you actually found the beige book interesting, which perhaps should be the headline of the morning. The beige book yeah. actually gave you some relevant information. What are you seeing that gives you a sense of inflation in the years to come? And how does that affect what you're investing in now? Yeah, you know, we, we've been worried about inflation for a very long time and obviously you know, haven't seen it despite um, money supply growing. I think you've got a few uh, different things there. You've got now supply shortages, uh, both uh, in, in goods and, and perhaps in labor. Um, and you, I think you have a, what's really changed is the political will. I think the political establishment today is much more willing and, in, in fact, in many cases, invites higher inflation. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's the main change versus the last few years, in addition to, obviously, massive fiscal and, and monetary stimulus. So as we think about it, you know, we're looking for companies with pricing power, companies that own hard assets. Sports teams is, is one of the uh, areas that we've gone. And I think a lot of wealthy people are, are thinking about those things as well. Sports teams, Chris, elaborate on that for us. Yes, live entertainment's been a theme for us for, for a long time. Um, you know, it's uh, kind of known that the younger generation pays for experiences rather than things. One of the things that they like, like generations before them, is watching sports, um, however they watch it. And so owning the Atlanta Braves or the New York Knicks uh, both, of, both of which are doing quite well, um, you know, is, is, a, is a great asset to own for the long term, their inflation conduits. I was going to say, Chris, the, the best way to get an exposure to that story, what do you think it is? Yeah, so I, I, my, my favorite sports name at the moment, um, all respect to uh, Manchester U, but is is Liberty Braves. It's owned, controlled by, uh, by John Malone, who we've followed for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, there's likelihood over the next two or three years that that um, company goes private in a private to public or public to private arbitrage. I think they're worth $42. Wow, I gotta say, 
Tom Keene actually took the day off after the Red Sox did lose. He hadn't been mentioning them because they had been winning. They lost. He took the day off, and now he's thinking about taking some of his leverage clash and investing it in the Red Sox. Looking forward, though, we're seeing a lot of interesting accounting mechanisms. This Facapalooza that we've been talking about, which really fueled a lot of the first quarter capital markets earnings, particularly in the equity wing for the big banks. How much does that draw your concern in terms of the fragility of this confidence? In other words, this idea that things are getting frothy on the margins. Well, just when you think things are frothy, they get frothier. Um, you know, interestingly, obviously, we've seen the, the SPAC market cool off considerably, um, which we've seen many times before. But, you know, you're going to have a, a, a large supply of new public companies to look at as these companies de-SPAC on the back end. Uh, that's going to drive a lot of fees. Um, and we, th we think the underpinnings of a, of a wave of M&A are, are there. Still low rates. Um, the strong want to get stronger. And um, so that's an opportunity to benefit from the advisors by owning the banks and you know, trying to find some targets that are going to get taken over, like Liberty Braves. Chris, always good to catch up to get your views, particularly on sports this morning. Chris Marangi there <laughs> of Gabelli Funds. I know Tom's going to miss this conversation. Oh yeah. Big Hello, traders. Time to place a stop on profit for Euro. As you can see, and all of you guys who follow this trade on Euro, we got yesterday, we purchased yesterday uh, Euro at 119, 80.6, right? So right now I'm going to place a stop on profit at 119, 82.6, just right here. So if you follow the trade and uh, that's it, we closed, we closed position. All of you guys uh, need to place stop on profit. If you uh, didn't manage to place stop on profit, you can wait a little bit because uh, I'm sure right now you have chance as well to place your stop on profit for euro as you can see so if you still hold position it's time to execute this position and collect the profit okay in our case we already uh, closed position in your case because we probably uh, set too quickly for you you didn't have time right now it's a chance right okay good trade well done and i'll speak to you later let's look for another good opportunity to trade forex of some of the potential turmoil in the months to come more still to come on this from new york city this morning good morning to you all alongside lisa brambitz i'm jonathan farrow tom Keane back with us on monday your equity market all-time highs up three on the s p we advance a tenth of one percent in the bond market yields in not even a basis point 156.93 a break of 160 in yesterday's session this friday at a record high this is bloomberg With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. There's been another mass shooting in the U.S. This time it happened in Indianapolis, where a gunman opened fire last night at a FedEx facility near the airport. Eight people were killed and at least four were wounded. Police say the shooter killed himself. It's not known if the gunman was an employee at FedEx. It will be all about China today when President Biden meets with Japan's Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. This will be the first in-person meeting with a foreign leader since taking office. China's shadow will loom large over almost every topic. The two are expected to discuss human rights, Taiwan, and supply chains, amongst other issues. In Vienna, negotiators are trying to resolve some big differences in the Iran nuclear talks. The Iranians are now demanding that the U.S. explicitly state what sanctions it would lift to unblock negotiations to revive the broken agreement. Iran says that in response, it would describe what it would do to scale back its nuclear activity. Congressional Democrats have introduced a bill to expand the number of justices on the U.S. Supreme Court from nine 
213. That would change the makeup of the court for the first time in 150 years. But the measure is not likely to go anywhere for now, even with the Democrats in charge of Congress. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she won't bring it to the floor. Republicans call it a power grab. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. is absolutely core to our business. Uh, it's uh, almost 20% of our franchise revenues uh, globally, uh, which is significantly more than most of our global peers uh, who are more in the mid-teens. We will invest in China, but also like, you know, we are also investing in the rest of Asia as well. Our top line growth uh, for the region has been um, close to 24% last year, you know, almost 20% of the group's revenue uh, as a percentage of the revenue of the group. So, uh, and this is where the group is counting on the growth. We see a company after a company, these are corporates committing to net zero. So um, pretty much across the board, there is an enthusiasm for putting capital to work to try to get us to a better carbon future. Credit Suisse has a fantastic brand name in Asia. We have obviously strong positions uh, in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong as our two main hubs, but uh, across across the region. BSO Now is your online home for brand new Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. Discover new releases each week that include behind the scenes storytelling with conductors including music director Andres Nelsons, guest composers and musicians, plus critically acclaimed archival concerts and more. Visit bso.org forward slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsored by Bank of America. few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. There were two reasons to do it. One, out of an abundance of caution to, re to see what we're dealing with, and B, to make sure they alert physicians about what to do with it. Hopefully, we'll get a decision quite soon as to whether or not we can get back on track with this very effective vaccine. And that was Dr. Fauci there on the J&J &J vaccine, which takes a pause 
here in the United States. From New York City for our audience worldwide, good morning to you all. Alongside Lisa Abravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. It's your Friday morning price action shaping up as follows on the S&P 500 all-time highs. You've desensitized by that headline yet. 41.66 on the S&P 500. Yields 157.10 on tens in America after a big rally through this week and particularly in yesterday's session. In the FX market, Euro dollar 119.87. We make a move towards 120, Lisa, up two-tenths of 1%. The euro, just a little bit stronger. You have been whipsawed out there, haven't you, by this dollar story? Coming into 21, Lisa, the consensus trade was pretty clear, wasn't it? Yeah. Dollar weaker, we like EM. It's got a whole lot more nuanced over the last month or so. And the key question here is how much are the moves that we're seeing today positioning, right? That people basically uh, whipped out some of their short dollar positions and now we're sort of recalibrating and can get back into a weaker dollar story. Same here with bond yields. People were betting that bond yields would go up dramatically. They did. How much is this a short squeeze as people reassess, John? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, and, and I've talked about journalists being seduced and we're often seduced by trying to come up with a neat narrative for a price move. And the neat narrative often does not include just positioning clear outs, Lisa. <laughs> And I think we've got a little bit of taste of that in the bond market yesterday as well. Let's talk about the vaccine rollout. It has been a really, really important week. We have been looking forward to the J&J &J vaccine because it's a single-dose regime. And the hopes were that we could vaccinate a lot of the world, not just this country, with the J&J one-dose effort. That got a hit this week. Let's bring in Andy Pecos, shall we? Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist. Professor, let's start there. What we're learning about the new vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, and the traditional ones, the J&Js, the AstraZeneca's of this world, so far? Well, I think it's important to note that even given some of the concerns that came out this week about the adenovirus-based vaccines, all the vaccines that are on the market, particularly here in the U.S., um, are performing quite well in terms of reducing uh, infection rates and, more importantly, in terms of reducing severe infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. So that's the positive spin that we always have to keep a focus on because these vaccines are still, all the data is still pointing to these vaccines being one of the most critical tools that we'll have to get this pandemic under control and to really reduce the number of cases that are out there. A lot of people criticize the response from the CDC and the FDA to pause the rollout of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine with six very worrisome cases, but in the context of 6.8 million doses of that vaccination already given. Andy, in your mind, do you think that helps support the rollout of vaccines, a big vaccination program like the one we're in right now, or does it undermine it? You know, an important principle in public health is that you want to be preemptive. You want to solve problems before they become major problems. And this action really falls into that category. The second you see a signature of a potential problem, we really have to assess how big of a problem that could be and what the strategy is going forward to make sure that we maintain the public trust. And, and in this case, these specific kind of clotting disease, and, and let's be clear, this is not just a problem with clotting. This is a very, very specific particular syndrome that involves clotting and low platelet numbers. So that's very unique. And by identifying these cases, identifying the populations that may be at risk, and distributing information about this to the medical community, we could probably, or will, we will actually, uh, be able to prevent a lot of serious adverse effects here because now the medical community will know how to treat these vaccine-related blood clotting disorders, which have to be treated differently from most normal clotting disorders. So I'm supportive of this. I think that we can now go ahead and use this as a way to tr really improve the public trust in the vaccine because we're paying attention to these things and we're making sure that we our path forward minimizes these adverse side effects. Dr. Pekosh, uh, that is the message from the medical community. It is better to be transparent to, enjoy, uh, to get some trust from an otherwise a somewhat hesitant population to get vaccinated. Vaccinated. And yet there was data that yesterday showing that as many as one in three doses of COVID vaccines are going unused in states across the country. Vaccine hesitancy, very much a real thing. Is what you're talking about enough to bring them back online if, frankly, they were hesitant before the issue with J&J &J even began? Absolutely not. I think vaccine hesitancy um, is a multifaceted issue. 
And I do firmly believe from going out there and from having some town halls with people to ask answer questions that they have, I think there's a large portion of people that are hesitant right now about taking the vaccine who are just looking for more information, for more guidance in terms of what the risks and benefits are. Um, there's so much inf misinformation out there that uh, tends to propagate much faster than the real information. So we really have to make an effort to educate people, make them comfortable with what's out there, because really the data is very, very positive, extremely positive about this vaccine and its ability to really uh, be the major tool to help us control the outbreak. Dr. Pekosh, sticking on that sort of one in three doses that have not been used in a number of states across the country, based on this hesitancy starting before 30 percent of the population has been vaccinated, 40 percent of the population has been vaccinated, does it indicate that it's going to take a lot longer to get to that herd immunity level? I know that that's a tricky uh, phrase, but that 70, 75 percent level that we're aiming for here. Uh, absolutely. Um, particularly when you think about the fact that right now we're limited to immunizing our adult population, those 16 and over. Um, that would really mean that we would have to get a high level of adults to really buy in and get the vaccine. Um, this even becomes more complicated when you talk about the equity issue and that there are a lot of social economic, racial groups, urban populations, which are even higher on the rate of, of vaccine hesitancy at this point in time. So there's a lot of work that be, needs to be done, particularly in the communication routes right now, because we have a significant amount of science right now supporting the safety and e efficacy of this. We have to think about the messaging, finding the populations that are hesitant about this and targeting those messages to those populations so that they can really get a fair understanding of all the benefits um, that are that are uh, coming with vaccination. Doctor, it's good to catch up. As always, it's good to see you. Have a good weekend, sir. Andrew Pekos there, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist. Your latest numbers in America, 3.35 million doses per day. Your daily average over the previous seven days, 198 million doses have been given so far in the United States of America. So let's take that 3.35 million doses a day rate, Lisa, to get to your 75% number that you mentioned, it would take three months. The issue, I think, for a lot of people is they wonder whether that 3.35 million per day actually starts gradually moving the other way, that we start bumping up against those constraints, because we've made a huge effort in this country in, over the last couple of weeks to really widen the eligibility pool, and then you start to bump up against hesitancy, which could show up in the numbers. And we already are seeing that. I mean, the idea that there are doses going unused, appointments that are going unfilled, is a sort of foreboding sign. Coming up on this program, Jason Draho, UBS Global Wealth Management Head of America's Asset Allocation. Some of these titles, honestly. Euro dollar 119.91, Treasury yields 157.10, equities all time highs from New York. This is Bloomberg. sells way more electric cars per capita than the U.S.? Norway. <laughs> well, I won't stand for it. In this neighborhood just outside Oslo, the majority of cars are electric. Last year, Norway became the first country in the world to sell more electric cars than any other. In December, EV market share was at 67%. In 2025, the country wants all cars sold to be zero emission. Fish loving. Oh, this place is adorable. Damn it. 
But why is Norway leading this development? The country is rocky, it's ice cold and with huge distances. The easy answer is politics. By giving the consumers benefits that pay off, more people will go electric when they're getting a new car. These perks could be no VAT when buying the car, reduced tolls, the possibility to drive in the bus lane, and quite a bit of free parking as well. 2021 is an election year in Norway, and the Climate and Environment Minister Sveinung Rotevatn believe the EV perks will be a hot topic in the campaigns, where removal of the perks is said to be a central issue. Everything we follow would suggest every bit of inflation is being passed through and then some. The market overly priced for that inflation risk in the near term. We're still going to have higher inflation to come. Powell has already made it very clear what they intend to do. They're, they're not doing anything. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. You've made it from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane taking a long weekend. You have made it to the end of the week, and what a week it's been. Retail sales, CPI, and a ton of bank earnings. Lisa, what stood out for you this week? Yeah, I was about to say, the week is not over. I'm glad that you have such optimism, but we still have well, hours there. left. We're almost there, at least for us. Um, but I will say that Morgan Stanley earnings, very interesting, and sort of capping one of the big themes of the week, in my opinion, which is bank earnings highlighting the lack of loan demand. Why? Is this a sign of perhaps weaker forward look to the economy, or is this just a sign of how much cash consumers and corporations have after incredible stimulus programs, both in the Fed standpoint uh, as well as the federal government? Overwhelmingly, the story is the latter and not the former. For many people who have come on this program, consumers, businesses flush with cash. Absolutely. And going forward from here, it's about what happens for these banks. And I think there would be a transition here, Lisa, as we pay down a savings rate as the economy reopens. We start to spend again. What does the loan demand look like in the back half of this year? Jared Cassidy of RBC has come on this program a couple of times in the last week, and he said exactly that. Second half, we should see some improvement. For me, the story, for me at least, has been the data and how we've responded to that data. So not just the data itself, how markets have reacted to it. And Lisa, I've been focused on that, and I know you have too. CPI hot, Treasuries rallied. Retail sales hot, Treasuries rallied. Yeah, well, and this really raises the question about later in the year, why are stocks confident and why are analysts confident that what we're seeing in the lack of loan demand is simply a blip and a sign of all the cash and actually will just add to the momentum later in the year, whereas bond investors are saying, oh, I don't know, this is kind of scary. Is that really the message that we can take or is this a positioning issue, the fact that foreign buyers really came into the market, the fact that the Fed was increasing their balance sheet and the fact that people were getting squeezed out of the short positions? John, to me, that really is the question. Yeah, I don't know if I'd use the word scary. 
Treasury on a week where Treasury yields have come down about eight, nine basis points. I don't think we're there yet. Tens at 157.10. I do think the cyclical rally has stalled, and I know you agree with that. Treasuries topped out on tens at the back end of March. We saw mid caps top out in the middle of March. We saw the commodity story really start to stall end of February, beginning of March, copper crude, EM as well. So that big cyclical position, those big consensus stories coming into 21, they have stalled out, Lee. So that's just a fact. It's in the numbers. There's also a question, though, and you raised this earlier in the week with bank earnings. If we do have a lack of loan demand, does that encourage perhaps even more risk taking by banks, by individuals? Certainly seeing that in markets as people try to seek for returns, because frankly, the risk has been not being exposed to risk enough, right? And so how much does this affect risk taking and how much does this create some potential potholes uh, in markets as we've seen with Arcagus and others? And that, I mean, it's an idiosyncratic story, not systemic. I'm not saying, oh my God, the world's falling, but this is definitely something on people's minds. Now, risk runs both ways. I'm with you to the downside. And I think overwhelmingly, the risk has been for many investors that you're not positioned for the upside. Exactly. Because we've seen a massive, massive move. Bank of America came out with a note this morning and said the year over year move of the March 20 low is the third biggest year over year move, Lisa, in the last 100 years. What a stat that is. It's been tremendous. And the reason why 2021 has been so interesting is because just because we haven't seen the headline figures of the indexes roll over in the same kind of dramatic way as we did in 20, uh, 2020, the underpinnings of the market, the internals have been churning just as much. It has been a hard market to get right at every turn. So Lisa's keeping me in check. Apparently, we've still got a few hours left of uh, Friday before we <laughs> get to, to the weekend. Sorry to break it to you. Let me get it's to the equity transitory. market and run through things. It is truly transitory. We will be at the weekend. <laughs> before you know it. In the equity market right now, S&P 500 futures up two. We advanced to 41.65 and up a little less than a tenth of 1%. In the bond market, yields coming in in yesterday's session. Let's call it 157 on tens. Yields basically unchanged this morning. And in foreign exchange, keep an eye out on euro dollar and the line in the sand is 120. Euro dollar right now, 119.89. Lisa advancing about two tenths of 1%. Yeah, and really today we are looking in about 30 minutes time. Maybe, maybe we'll get it earlier. Morgan Stanley coming out with the earnings. John, just to talk about where we've come from, to give you a sense of how much Morgan Stanley shares have increased, they have doubled in the past 12 months. To give you a sense of how much good news is priced in, a lot of that good news coming from the capital markets, we're looking at that, and we're looking at how they have incorporated E-Trade as well as, of course, uh, their acquisition of Eaton Vance. We'll be looking for that. 8.30 a.m., the dynamism of the U.S. housing market. We get housing starts, we get building permits, expected to be very hot. People want new homes. Builders are responding. Key question, could this potentially be a driver of loan demand as people take out more mortgages later in the year. And today, President Biden kicking off his discussions with uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, Suga, who is going to be joining him at the White House, discussing Taiwan, discussing China, perhaps coming up with some sort of strategy uh, in the region, John. And discussing golf. Matt Miller, our colleague, good friend, he's been all over Thank this. You. Really? In the last week. Absolutely. Really? We're really we going a, there? We have a Japanese Masters <laughs> I champion. I don't expect this from you, John. We need con no, I think we do need to congratulate Matsuyama. Absolutely. Absolutely. I guarantee, Lisa, in the news conference, I guarantee it comes up, it has to come up, that we have a Japanese Masters champion. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Congratulations to Mr. Matsuyama and his caddy as well, which made some really nice headlines too. From New York then, this is the setup for you. Equities all-time highs in the bond market. Yields coming in through the week, down by about nine basis points to 157.10. But more broadly, we've been talking about this for about a month now. Has the cyclical trade taken a pause? Or are we in a new stage of this market cycle? That's what Jason Draho is thinking about, UBS Global Wealth Management Head of America's Asset Allocation. Jason, let's start there. How do you identify the difference between the two, a pause and a turn in this market cycle? I think, you know, we had a reflation trend that went on really for about six months, beginning almost really last September, October, carried on through roughly, you know, you know mid-March. And it's been really been on sort of a pause since then. I think the last leg that really kind of drove it to some extent was the movement of rates higher that began in February, kind of rallied, well, really began by the start of the year, but really kind of accelerated in February into early March. And once it got to mid-March, you know, the 10-year was in the, the 1.6, 1.7 range. And in some ways, the, the move in bond market was, it was interesting because it was the, the, the lag, right? I mean, last year, late last year, we had really good news. We saw equity markets rally, yet treasury markets didn't move very much. And this year, that it made the big move. I think that was sort of the last leg for this stage of the, the recovery. Now that we've kind of consolidated to some extent, we've seen obviously a pullback in, in yields recently, I think more for positioning than in any sort of fundamental reasons. I view this as more of a pause because when we look at the underlying fundamental story, you know, the data that we've gotten over the past couple of weeks on the U.S. economy from jobs, ISM, retail sales, all of it's consistent with the expectation of growth acceleration. It's even sort of better than expected. 
So I view this as a, as a pause. Now the reacceleration or the, or the reflation trade, if it kicks in again, which we think it will, it may not be the same you know, impact as it was for the past six months, but there, I think there's still more to room for on, at least over the next six month horizon. Jason, you touched on what led and what lagged. As you look across asset right now, which asset class is in the driving seat for you? So if you think about like what's done very well in terms of like, you know, think of the rate inflation trade, Yeah, you know, small caps did very, very well. And you know, their performance was spectacular, uh, you know, over the past year, over the past six months, and you've seen it sort of pull back. It probably overshot on the upside, maybe it's overshooting on the downside right now. But still fundamentally, I think, you know, if you look at what's underperformed for a long period of time, it's still value. And while it did outperform growth for the past six months, you know, the little bit of the rotation in the past six weeks or four weeks, I think that's where there's still opportunity. Because there's still skepticism that, you know, this is a fundamental change, which is, I think, justifiable. But, you know, the debate in the market is whether this is a, you know, is it a six-week move, a six-month move for value, or is it a multi-year move? I think there's no one really believes it's a multi-year move, or at least not many people. But I think it's more than a six-month trade. And so I think that's where there's still upside is, is in the more traditional value sectors, like financial, potentially like energy as well. Jason, what's your allocation to Bitcoin? Uh, well, we don't have a formal allocation. Uh, I think from a portfolio perspective, it, if you really look at it as an asset class, it has properties that are, you know, make it difficult to allocate. You know, it's highly volatile. And in, when you're trying to calculate what's an expected return, well, that's a really uncertain thing. So it's almost a little bit like gold. It has really high volatility, but I think it's, it's you know, return potential is low. So when you think about, do I want to allocate out of equities into Bitcoin? Do I want to allocate out of bonds? It gives you a lot of volatility, both uncertain return. The way I would sort of think about it is almost you want to carve out a very small percentage of your portfolio. You can put it into Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, but you have to be prepared that, you know, over six months, you could lose 50% of that. It's just a highly volatile asset class. So I think the way you think about it has to be different than the way you would think about more traditional asset allocation, even though people are looking at it as, as, as potentially as like another asset class. I don't think it's there yet that you want to feel comfortable allocating to it. Jason, I asked that question. I imagine you get that a lot from your clients. Have you been having this conversation more frequently? Uh, it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. It's definitely kind of come up more recently. Uh, you know, the Coinbase public listing kind of raises more questions. But I think it's certainly been very consistent or common question for the past you know, six months as I've seen Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies you know, rally quite a bit. You know, people are just trying to wrap their heads around it. You know, the common question is, you know, am I missing out? Is this something that I need to be invested in and how to think about it? And so there's an element of you know, cryptocurrencies in general, where it, what's the future? But I think if you just want to look at it as an investment, you can start to say, well, what kind of returns can I get? What does it do to my portfolio? And at least try to brand it down to fundamentals. So at least you're thinking about it somewhat in, in a reasonable way. And then you can sort of say, well, then if that's not the case, then how do I want to allocate it to it? So I just want people to have a rational, thoughtful conversation as opposed to, you know, the kind of the hype or the speculation that gets around it. Because it is a, it tends to kind of be an issue that elicits emotions one way or another, and we want to take the emotion out of it and have it sort of a thoughtful conversation. Jason, always thoughtful to get you on the show. Thank you, sir. Jason Draho there, UBS Global Wealth Management Head of America's Asset Allocation. That question, Lisa, am I missing out? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. I think we've all missed out <laughs> on this rally. I say we all. I'm talking about myself in Bitcoin. It has been an absolutely rip-roaring rally year today so far. Yeah, record highs yesterday. Today it's off a bit more, but I will say uh, it has been a hard one to get right. I still keep going back to what Troy Gajewski said, which is basically your allocation to Bitcoin has either made your year or broken your year, depending on which side you are on. To me, this really raises a question. Do you jump on the train or do you flee? And I asked that question uh, just now to Jason because a lot of wealthier individuals are just asking the same questions. It's a new asset class a newer asset class and it's a growing asset class and I think we've got to go back to something we've discussed over the last hour always trying to tie things back to fundamentals this is just a new growing asset class and I think sitting here trying to tie it back to inflation say maybe too premature to do that what will be interesting in the future though is how investors are conditioned to believe that something like crypto or bitcoin behaves in a certain way that is connected to fundamentals and does play a part in the broader portfolio. And maybe we move away from something like gold, which has been viewed as that traditional safe haven and traditionally providing you that inverse correlation to maybe risk and also the inflation story as well, because it has not done that, Lisa, so far this year. Well, that's what I was going to say. If people wanted to make this bet and they tried gold, they failed. What do you do with that information going forward? It has not worked. Joining us, Stephen Stanley, Amherst Pierpont, chief economist on a booming economy in the United States. For America. For our audience worldwide from New York City this morning, I'm racing towards the weekend. I'm sure you are too. Lisa <laughs> oh, seems to want to take her time. I've got no idea. 4166 <laughs> on the SP 500 in a beautiful New York City at record highs on the SP. We're up about a tenth of 1%. This is Bloomberg.
With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. There was a mass shooting last night at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. According to police, eight people were killed and at least five others were hospitalized. Authorities say the shooter killed himself. The FedEx operation is located near the Indianapolis airport. It's not clear whether the shooter worked there. In China, there's not been an economic rebound quite like this one. First quarter GDP rising a record 18.3% from a year ago. But you've got to remember, of course, that's when the economy was shut down in an attempt to control the coronavirus pandemic. So China's economy improved only slightly from the fourth quarter of 2020. Consumer spending had lagged during the early stages of the recovery, but it picked up in the first quarter. In Hong Kong, media tycoon and pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai has been sentenced to 14 months in prison. Lai was convicted of attending two unauthorized protests. He also was charged with more national security offenses. Authorities have been pursuing cases against Hong Kong's most high-profile dissidents. And the European Union probably will not renew its coronavirus vaccine contracts with AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. That's according to France's industry minister. Both vaccines have been linked to rare blood clots. The EU's already started talks about contracts with BioNTech, Pfizer and Moderna. Global News 24 hours a day on air. And on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Minority myth wasn't something that was fabricated by the Asian Americans. It was created as a tool to alienate the Black and the Asian American communities, and it was incredibly successful. We know the racism didn't begin yesterday. We know it's probably not going to end tomorrow, but it is our job to make sure that there's progress and we keep people safe, we give people dignity. And I spent a lot of time last year to just listen, to understand, to reflect and understand what I could do as, as a leader of this organization. For many years, we've been very shareholder focused, and now there really is much more of a community requirement. The economic downturn in the U.S., we're seeing unemployment and income losses affecting women more than men. Two thirds of the jobs lost in South Africa were women's jobs. So I think we're in a moment of crisis. Clearly our societies are reproducing, not producing inequality. We need better public policy and we need companies to step up.
Bloomberg Surveillance, Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Extraordinary market day. This rally just keeps on going. But there is a tipping point. The business team you love to watch. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. For all of us, it's been a, a long journey to this moment. There is a great deal of work and planning to do in the months ahead to ensure that the withdrawal is responsible, deliberate, and safe. But that work is going to be matched by our enduring support for Afghanistan, economically, diplomatically, politically. Tony Blinken there, the U.S. Secretary of State, on the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan later this year. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Tom Keane on vacation for a couple of days. He'll be back with us on Monday. Let's get to the price action at the moment. We're set up as follows on the S&P 500. Equity futures drifting higher, up five. We advanced a little more than a tenth of 1%. Record highs, 41.67 on the S&P 500. Into the bond market, down another basis point. Your 10-year, 156.57. Crude doing okay, 63 handles, 63 dollars and about 54 cents. And on euro dollar, we approach, make a move back towards 120, up two tenths of one percent at 119.87. Had a ton of bank earnings through the week. Morgan Stanley coming at 7:30 Eastern time, due out. I stress due out in about 12 minutes time. Shanali Bassett will break down those numbers for us, our Wall Street correspondent. Shanali, just a brief preview, if you can, what you're looking for yeah. in about 12 minutes. Uh, well, the bar is super high for that equities trading business. It is the number one on Wall Street, but we've seen nearly 50% rises at JP Morgan and then almost 70% over at Goldman Sachs. What do we know about the head of trading over at Morgan Stanley? Ted Pick carries high levels of paranoia. He talks about it all the time that will be showing up today. The bar is kind of low as far as analyst estimates go, but again, after we saw throughout the week, we're going to want to see them perform in those investment banking businesses as well as keep those margins nice and tight at that wealth management division that has grown with E-Trade. Shanali, looking forward to the coverage. Stay close. Mm -hmm. Those numbers I say due out, Lisa, because we've seen so many early reports so far this week. It's almost like they were so excited to get it out there to that they just couldn't, trading was. <laughs> they couldn't resist. It was just look at how good we are. Something like that. Emily I, Wilkins joins us now from DC, our Bloomberg government reporter. Emily, I want to talk about something that's not been talked about this week, and that's infrastructure. Keep talking about foreign policy. What's happened to infrastructure talks, negotiations, bipartisan efforts? So that's absolutely been underway on Capitol Hill. You're right. It's been a huge week for foreign policy. Obviously, that continues today with the prime minister's visit. But over on Capitol Hill, away from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, it is all about infrastructure. And there's a lot of discussion at this point about exactly how this package is going to pass. You saw Republicans yesterday come out and say that they could support a smaller infrastructure package, perhaps $600 billion to $800 billion, and that would be for roads, highways, sort of traditional infrastructure items. And it's interesting because that amount that Republicans are talking about, if you look at Biden's plan, he's already proposing about the same for traditional infrastructure. So there's an idea that perhaps if they decided to move just the traditional infrastructure piece on its own, that could garner bipartisan support. And then Democrats could perhaps use the budget reconciliation process to move tax bills and other social related items with only Democratic votes. Emily, I'm curious about the internecine Democratic debates, the idea of the SALT tax caps that have gotten a lot more attention in Congress. What's the latest there in terms of the willingness to repeal some of the caps that were implemented under President Trump. So we're seeing the salt cap opposition really ramp up. We saw a bipartisan group of 30 lawmakers get together and say, you know what, we need to make sure that salt caps are lifted and removed in this upcoming infrastructure plan. But yesterday, we also heard some pushback to that idea from New York Congresswoman Elstandia Estacio cortez She said that, you know what, this, these caps, they are not going to wind up benefiting lower and middle income individuals. And that's what this upcoming tax bill needs to focus on. And this is a sentiment shared by a number of progressive Democrats that the tax bill needs to sort of, they see it as needing to make equal a little more the American tax system, benefit lower and middle income earners. Emily, can you just push forward and help us with the benchmark events that we're going to be looking for to signal how quickly some of these infrastructure plans are moving forward? 
So right now the timeline is to actually get an infrastructure bill through one of the main House committees by around mid-May. And remember, at this point, we haven't seen the text yet. There's still a lot of requests going on behind the scenes, lawmakers jockeying to get their priorities into this piece of legislation. So at this point, the sausage is kind of still getting made. We're going to start expect to see results around mid-May. Uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi has promised that the House will get their work done by July 4th. At that point, it will go over to the Senate and sort of the additional complications there with needing all 50 Senate on board, as well as the Senate parliamentarian to sign off anything that might be going through that budget reconciliation process. There's a belief, Emily, that bills start big and get smaller. Do you get the feeling that this one gets bigger? You know what? I think a lot in terms of this bill about what we saw with that last coronavirus package. That package, very early on, they were tossing around that $1.9 trillion number, and it wound up being $1.9 trillion. I think the $2.25 trillion number, it's something that the Biden administration has thought about in terms of size. Certainly, there are more than enough proposals to reach that mark that Democrats are putting out there. And so it does seem like, I would assume at least, that we'd see something similar similar this time in keeping with that 2.25 trillion number. I think the bigger question is how much of that is actually going to be paid for through taxes and other revenue sources and how much of that is going to be increasing the American debt. Emily Wilkins, it's good to see you down in Washington, Bloomberg government reporter on the latest. So much talk this week about foreign policy, and let me be clear, rightly so. We have to cover the infrastructure story side of things as well for this market, for this economy, if anything else. We've got to do a couple of things before we get to the weekend. I know I'm trying to get there quickly. <laughs> you really are. Before we get there, in about seven minutes' time, we're meant to get Morgan Stanley numbers. And Lisa, after seeing the execution at Goldman in the first quarter and the tremendous performance in these investment banks, the trading that shanali has been talking about over the last several days, the bars got high for Morgan Stanley coming into these numbers. Yeah, although Morgan Stanley has executed really well over the past few years, and frankly, they've come out ahead of Goldman Sachs on a number of different fronts. So, you know, the bar is high. They could potentially meet it. I think it'll be really really interesting to see how they have brought in Eaton Vance, how they have brought in E-Trade as they try to get on this retail trading trend. Basically, is this a template for what's to come in terms of consolidation and acquisitions as banks look to deploy some of their cash? It's been a really different approach from Mr. Gorman over at Morgan Stanley, hasn't it, Lisa? Yeah, and they've actually come out ahead, right? I mean, there's been this whole Goldman Sachs-Morgan Stanley battle because they both have a similar kind of profile, less of a reliance on lending to corporations and lending to consumers, and they've tried to move Move more into that, but they really are dependent on the trading capital markets intensive areas, which have thank, frankly been on fire and show signs of continuing to be so, John. The stock has done okay as well. It's up by 17.93% year to date on Morgan Stanley yeah. coming into the year. Pocket Goldman's change. had an even bigger year. Some of these banks have delivered huge gains year to date. And what are we? In the middle of April so far. So Morgan Stanley out in about five minutes. We'll bring you those numbers, get nice reaction from Shanali Basak, our Wall Street correspondent. We'll get some reaction from Bloomberg Intelligence as well. Before we get there, let me give you a flavor of the price action. Cross asset in the United States of America going in to the weekend. Yes, the weekend. S&P 500 <laughs> futures up four, five points, up sure a little more Friday? than a tenth of 1%. 41.67. You're damn right it's Friday. <laughs> yields are coming in a basis point at 156.22 on tens. I know I've got a longer I day. <laughs> Stop reminding me. I'm just going to keep you, going. I need to pre-record that on Thursday <laughs> night or something and play out on Friday. Euro dollar 119.86. Can I just say New York City today? Beautiful. Isn't it just 41.67 on the S&P?
Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Global markets never sleep, so stay connected with Francine Lacroix in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kaylee Lines in New York. Perspective on the day ahead. Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. It is 7.30 in New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning to all. Alongside Tom Keane, who's usually here, Lisa Bramis and me today. Tom Keane will be back on Monday. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Morgan Stanley numbers dropping across the Bloomberg terminal with futures at record highs. Let me bring you the numbers. First quarter adjusted EPS, $2.22 against a year-over-year -year number of $0.99. Cents. First quarter net interest income, $2.03 billion, the estimate $1. 0.51 billion for the wealth management side of the business. Net revenue, 6.0 billion dollars. The estimate, 5.71 billion. First quarter net revenue for the bank for Morgan Stanley, 15.7 billion dollars, up 65 <laughs> percent year on year. Lisa, the numbers just incredible. Morgan Stanley saying they're resuming their share buyback program in the first quarter of 2021. So it's another bank, Lisa, just delivering some really nice numbers. Yeah, I'm curious how people are going to try to poke holes in this. It looks like the first reaction is not to poke holes in it with the shares up more than 1%. But John, really, this is a blowout. The idea of 64% increase year over year. It wasn't like the first quarter was that terrible for the banks, but it just highlights how amazing it has been in 2021 even versus 2020. First quarter institutional investment banking revenue, $2.61 billion. The estimate, $2.01 billion. So it's an upside surprise on Morgan Stanley numbers this morning. On the capital return program, resuming the share buyback program in the first quarter of 2021, repurchased $2.1 billion of outstanding stock in the quarter. Looking at the reaction in the stock market, Morgan Stanley just turning a little bit lower in the pre-market. We're down a little more than one percentage point right now to about $80 in the pre-market. Market. So it's a slight move lower. Get us some commentary from Mr. Gorman over at Morgan Stanley, the CEO, saying Eaton Vance takes investment management to over $1.4 trillion in assets. James Gorman going on to say that the firm is very well positioned for growth. I know that Shanali Basak spent the last couple of minutes, as I've been babbling on, going through the numbers to talk about this in a much better way than I can. So let's bring Shanali in for some early reaction. So you do have them beating on a number of fronts here, John. You have them beating on revenue. You have them beating on expectations expectations at that asset management unit. You have them beating on the pre-tax margin for that wealth management unit as well. All good signs. Tiny little minus from Morgan Stanley, one of the biggest merger advisors in the world. They did come in short of expectations on their advisory business, though their equity underwriting, where they compete neck and neck with Goldman Sachs, we do see them beating, bringing in more than a billion dollars in equity underwriting revenue. So, you know, you, people will absorb these numbers. They'll look at how they stand competitively compared to their peers. Equity and fixed income trading, uh, you know, just below $3 billion, beating expectations largely, but again, in pure volumes a bit lighter than their two bigger peers. Mr. Wealth Management, the company, the bank, bringing in inflows of 105 billion dollars for Morgan Stanley. Just pouring through more headlines, Shanali. The stock is down a little bit. Look, I know it's early days, and, and the first move off the back of earnings, Shanali, is not necessarily where we finish the day right now. If there's some early disappointment at all in any of these numbers right now, can you see it? Let me give you some perspective here, right? You sure. have Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs competing on um, competing on investment banking, right? You have Goldman Sachs giving you more than 30% return on equities. Uh, you have ROTCE at Morgan Stanley over 21%. You can Compare that with JP Morgan, which a lot of their results also included that big reserve release. But Morgan Stanley is a little cleaner than that. But again, you're comparing it with Goldman Sachs now on returns in investment banking. As Lisa had mentioned, Morgan Stanley in the stock market has been doing better. Their market cap is about $30 billion more than Goldman Sachs, and they're trading at a higher multiple to book value. So, you know, you can meet or beat expectations, but again, this is about competition. And when you look over to, you know, the other side of Manhattan is the competitor keeping a better lid on costs. 
as well as competing just as heavily in those investment banking businesses. Shanali, stay close. I want to bring in Alison Williams of Bloomberg Intelligence, who's standing by for us and is screaming our key goss. Alison, I want to bring you in just quickly. What are you seeing in this statement? So I think the negative is the equity trading revenue. As you know, they're the biggest player, and their growth in that business was only 17% versus the strength of peers, and it looks like there's a charge related to a hedge fund client, which we can only assume is Archibos, um, $644 million. So um, I think that will probably bring some questions, and a subsequent $267 million. So altogether, um, pretty sizable. So right now, just to bring you some more headlines, Morgan Stanley, FIC sales and trading, fixed income currencies and commodities for the first quarter did beat estimates $2.97 billion versus an estimate of $2.19 billion. Allison, we've been talking about Goldman Sachs versus Morgan Stanley. Who won the first quarter? Well, I think the uh, hedge fund hit is really going to put a dent into things. Um, and it's interesting because Goldman had been saying uh, immaterial, Morgan Stanley had been quiet, which we assumed was manageable. And it did prove manageable. They still had equity revenue up 17%. But we did not see this. We did not see the hit to Goldman's equity trading numbers. They were able to um, grow their net revenue up 70 percent. Uh, J.P. Morgan up almost 50 um, percent. And um, meanwhile, Morgan Stanley really taking a hit. Um, uh, if it had this, you know, hit not happened, they would have been very competitive. But I think there's going to be a lot of uh, questions around this. People are looking forward. And one interesting note is what John was mentioning about Eaton Vance, that the investment management addition to Morgan Stanley brought the assets to over $1.4 trillion. How much are other banks going to look at Morgan Stanley, what they've done with Eaton Vance, what they've done with E-Trade as a template for how to make acquisitions going forward? So I think the other banks are interested in acquisitions. So Goldman has done some smaller things. Um, United Capital was perhaps the biggest thing that they had done on the wealth side of things. But in, in general, if you look at Morgan Stanley's traditional asset management, they've been smaller um, than people like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And the Eaton Vance is really helping to get them there. They've had really good equity inflows in recent quarters. I haven't seen um, the inflows today, but based on what we've seen in sort of the active equity area, we'd expect that they continue that very strong trend. Alison, I'll come back to you for a final word in just a moment. Morgan Stanley in the pre-market now positive by eight tenths of one percent. Goldman positive also by almost three quarters of one percent. And there's the headline dropping across the Bloomberg. Morgan Stanley posting a $911 million loss tied to Archegos Capital. I want to bring back in Shanali Basak for some reaction to this. Shanali. Yeah, certainly. That's almost a billion dollars. Uh, to Allison's point, 644 on the single event and then subsequent losses of more than $200 million. On top of that, the revenue increase was less at both the fixed income trading unit and the equities trading unit in terms of a percentage increase than both J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. So they will get some questions about where they stand on market share, uh, as well as why there was almost a billion dollars of losses tied to Archegos. Alison, I want to bring you back in and talk about the price action as well. We're positive on both Goldman and Morgan Stanley this morning. It's early days. It's pre-market trading at about 7.37 this morning in New York City. I want to talk about the year-to-date story as well. Goldman's up about 28% year-to-date. Morgan Stanley up by a little less than 20% so far, Alison. We talk about these two banks as one of the same. How much daylight is there between these two banks right now? So I think the key difference is Goldman's, um, you know, their exposure to trading. Morgan Stanley is, is probably the second highest, but with these two deals, as we just discussed, they're really increasing the shift towards wealth. And obviously, the huge um, beats that we saw this quarter were well above analyst estimates, but I think that um, investors sort of could see the trends and knew that there was going to be some upside, obviously, perhaps not anticipa anticipating the strength. And I think going forward, you know, th the positive thing is this is the seasonally strongest quarter, and they uh, mostly knocked it out of the uh, park, you know, notwithstanding some of the, the hits to prime brokerage. And the investment piping, investment banking pipelines are at records at Goldman and J.P. Morgan. And Morgan Stanley did have um, some pretty significant growth in fees. We're going to listen to what they say on pipelines as well. So I think the fact that, um, you know, we do have that sustained strength. You know, in general, I think it's hard. We see a lot of the stocks, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news. Goldman was still up on the day. Yep. And I think that is really looking forward to some of the momentum continuing.
continuing in the second quarter. The Goldman right now is still up by eight tenths of one percent. Morgan Stanley slightly negative. If I keep doing this, it's going to be like a horse race. <laughs> yes. It's positive a tenth of one percent on Morgan Stanley. I'm just going to stop. Remains going to pick up in just a moment. Yeah. James Goldman and Morgan Stanley talking about that pipeline through the rest of this year, saying the firm is very well positioned for growth. Shanali, I just want to turn to you for a final word. We've had every single big bank on Wall Street so far. It's been a big quarter for many of them in terms of year-to-date equity gains, the stock price gains, but also for some of these businesses, these numbers have been absolutely stellar. Yeah, you know, it's still a long year ahead, John. <laughs> and the thing is, Goldman said that prime brokerage was consolidating. What becomes of that Archegos hit and their future in prime brokerage? Any tightening moving forward? Relationship with clients changing? The Wall Street will be watching very, very closely for any clues. Shanali, and we'll be catching up with you through the morning on this story. As Morgan Stanley comes out with some decent numbers, widely expected because the rest of the street was so decent in the first quarter. Some decent numbers and talking up a better outlook as well. The CEO, James Gorman, saying the firm is very well positioned for growth. But a headline that I think gets everybody's attention, Lisa, a $911 million loss tied to Archegos Capital. That family office, that single family office, has had so much damage <laughs> on so many banks. It's been quite remarkable. But it sheds a spotlight on risk management at the different banks. You've been talking about execution. Why did Goldman Sachs avoid it? Why did Morgan Stanley get hit? Why did Credit Suisse get hit? Why did Nomura get hit? Why did JP Morgan not even get its foot wet in this deal, John? Yeah, and that's why we said execution, execution for Goldman Sachs, because that was a tremendously executed quarter for Goldman. That wasn't just about the climate, the weather. That was about doing things right and doing things quick. And I think with our Archegos, the, uh, the quick part, Lisa, seems to be the key part, acting quickly. I want to bring Romain Bosley to get you up to date on a horse race in this market right now yeah. with a price action. Hey, Romain. Yeah, and you made some great points there on Morgan Stanley. Remember, we've seen a little bit of a fade here after we got the earnings out of Goldman, after we got out of a Bank of America. Keep in mind, stellar performance, but of course, you know, there was also stellar stock performance heading into this, that Archegos numbers uh, on the both in terms of what they uh, lost uh, off of that trade as well as the lingering losses after that. Certainly going to be of concern there. We did get Alcor earnings last night. There is a broader story in there about the reflation trade, about aluminum prices, and more importantly about China actually trying to tamp down production here. That's actually been good for Alcoa. Splunk, uh, we're getting an executive departure there. Tim Tully, who's been the chief technology officer there since 2017 and was largely considered to be an architect of a lot of the good news coming out of that company. He's moving on uh, to something else right now. You're seeing the shares take a leg down. We flip up the board. Let's bring you your Coinbase update for the day here. Down slightly here in pre-market after falling slightly yesterday. An exit event for a lot of investors. Continues a pace here. Kathy Wood did pick up another uh, 300,000 plus shares uh, in the overnight hours here. So, uh, uh, certainly some people still doubling down here on the longer term growth story here. And an interesting story last night here, the NFL uh, creating two, uh, three new partnerships, I would say, uh, with uh, sports betting companies, DraftKings, uh, Caesars, and Flutter. This is a big deal, of course. Remember, the NFL sort of for years uh, really sort of tapped or tap dance around the idea of just how much sports betting uh, actually played into what was going on in the company. Two big deals here. You're seeing DraftKings get a bid here. in the Remain, great work as always, yeah. sir. Looking forward to the close a little bit later this afternoon on Bloomberg Television alongside Caroline Hyde, and of course, Taylor Riggs as well. Can I call it weekend yet? Nope. I'm not told yet. I can't. I'm told <laughs> I can't. But that does wrap up the expected news so far, the scheduled news with Morgan Stanley We've numbers out. We've got more scheduled news, have we? What yes, have we got? we've got economic Housing. data. We've oh, got, we've got well, that's a big permits. deal. Yeah, we've got I'll building hang around permits. For building permits uh, you for should you. do that. It's been the hottest uh, housing market okay. since 2007. But also, we get some interesting conversations, frankly, uh, throughout the day as we try to reset. I got to say. You keep selling the show, Lisa. I'm going to keep trying. I've got to say, the rates move was really interesting this week. This sort of conundrum is this as good as I, it gets? I, I mean, agree. this whole I you know, said this that idea of record highs. You did say that. I, I think did. that there's so much good stuff. I think bank analysts think how I'm thinking right now. They're just so happy this is over after the busiest <laughs> week for them for the quarter. Morgan Stanley coming out with some really nice numbers. James Gorman, the CEO, saying we're well positioned for growth. But the headline has been the headline story, really, of the last couple of months. It's the losses tied to Archegos. A family office, if we can call it that. Still haven't determined what we can call it right now. Posting a $911 million loss tied to Archegos Capital. I can tell you at the corner of my eye, I can see Shanali Basak's been working the phone, so we'll get some reaction from Shanali <laughs> a little bit later in the program over the next couple of hours. Morgan Stanley, 79.88. Here's your horse race. We're down by a little more than one percentage point. For our audience worldwide, what a week it's been. I think that's why I want to get to the weekend. 
It's just been such a long, long week. Yields. They all have been. 155 on tens and down wow. almost three basis points. There's another leg lower. See? Heard That's on Bloomberg Radio, seen on Bloomberg <laughs> TV. Lisa's selling it hard. <laughs> this is Bloomberg Surveillance. is absolutely core to our business. Uh, it's uh, almost 20% of our franchise revenues uh, globally, uh, which is significantly more than most of our global peers uh, who are more in the mid-teens. We want to invest globally uh, in China, but also like, you know, we are also investing in the rest of Asia as well. Our top line growth uh, for the region has been um, close to 24% last year. You know, almost 20% of the group's revenue uh, as a percentage of the revenue of the group. So, uh, and this is where the group is counting on the growth. We see uh, company after company, these are corporates committing to net zero. So um, pretty much across the board, there is an enthusiasm for putting capital to work to try to get us to a better carbon future. Credit Suisse has a fantastic brand name in Asia. We have obviously strong positions uh, in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong as our two main hubs, but uh, across across the region. We're early on in this year. I know we've already sort of penciled in six or seven percent growth and a big fall in unemployment, but under outcome-based policy, we really want to see that. I'm bullish on the rebound, but I know we have a long way to go before the job is complete. There's no textbook for this. You don't want to be too preemptive, but I also don't want to be so reactive that we're late. I think it's too early to talk about uh, changing monetary policy while we're still in the pandemic tunnel. Countries that entered this crisis with limited fiscal space, with more vulnerabilities, need to be supported for the benefit of the world. The transparency of the debt burden for the poorest countries needs to be increased. There needs to be fuller disclosure. Trading revenues coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. This bed has been pretty, it, 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 it started to lead, but it often follows the market. The market tries to push forward. The Fed has, has held its line so far, but the question is, can they continue to do that if the data not only surprises to the upside, but persists to surprise to the upside? Well, the data certainly did that this week on CPI and on retail sales as well. George Borey there, Wells Fargo Asset Management Fixed Income Specialist from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Lisa Brabitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Tom Keane at home for a long weekend. Here's your equity market. Four straight weeks of gains. That's what we're on course for on the S&P 500. Futures 41.67, up five points on a day and up a little more than a tenth of 1%. All-time highs at a close in Thursday's session. Yields come in again by a couple of basis points. 
point. Early days, but there we are, 155.17 on tens. Crude unchanged at 63 dollars and about 42 cents. And on euro dollar, euro firmer, stronger, higher. Euro dollar 119.89. That's where we are. Cross asset stock story of the last 30 minutes. Morgan Stanley. So switch up the board and let's get to Morgan Stanley. That stock down by a little more than one percentage point after a really tidy year to date gain. 79 dollars and about 90 cents. Lisa, the story a familiar one. Investment banking really decent on the trading side of the business. Fixed sales and trading revenue $2.97 billion. The estimate $2.19 billion. Sales trading and revenue at the equity side of the business $2.88 billion. The estimate $2.6 But what I think got a lot of people's attention was finally some clarity on a number. $911 million loss tied to our Kegos Capital. It also raises a question, though, price to perfection, the fact that we're focusing on the $911 million loss. When they doubled profit, uh, when they beat expectations, when they beat expectations, they put out a really stellar earnings report their shares are down in pre-market trading. People are focusing on their Arcagus loss. The idea is we are looking for perfection and we are looking for any holes in that assumption. How much are we actually baking in to the valuations that we're looking at? I think a lot of people did that with Goldman earlier this week, Lisa. Just saw the numbers and were like, yeah, okay. And monster <laughs> upside surprise yeah. from Goldman. Some of these numbers have been tremendous from the big banks, including Morgan Stanley, but it's that loss. And the lack of clarity we've had from some of the big US banks, Lisa, around those numbers too, when we finally get a number, posting a $911 million loss tied to Archegos Capital. We'll keep an eye on that story. I know Shanali will as well. We're down nine-tenths of 1% on Morgan Stanley's stock. I need to stop doing this because this stock has just been all over the place. I think you should do it with, a, with like a horse racing voice. Minutes. I can do that really, really quickly. Oh, yeah. You want. I'm not going to do that Sachs now. going up really quickly. And nope, down. Some, more, let's nope. let's okay. not. <laughs> Mark Abana joins us now. Bank of America Securities Head of U.S. Race Strategy. Mark, <laughs> substantial further progress. They're the words we're all interested in. The Fed won't define them. Are we there yet? I don't think we're there yet, but I agree with you. I think they're going to be the three most important words for financial markets over the next quarter or two. It's substantial further progress, and that holds the key to determining when the Fed will begin to slow their asset purchases, which will eventually pave the way for them to potentially raise interest rates. Now, the Fed hasn't told us what substantial further progress means. We believe that it likely means a labor market that is back to pre-COVID levels. The Fed has been reiterating that we're in an 8 million job hole. Um, that's the level of employment where we are today versus where we were pre-pandemic. But we anticipate a lot of progress in closing that hole and in filling that hole over the next few months. We anticipate essentially million job growth months over the next several months. And we believe that that will allow for the Fed to assess that we are making substantial further progress, uh, likely by the end of the year that will have been achieved. And we anticipate that the Fed will begin to uh, signal that they're moving in that direction um, to agree that there has been substantial further progress by the summer or the early fall. We're sort of thinking, you know, August, um, Jackson Hole, or potentially September FOMC for when we could see a shift in the timing uh, for when asset purchases will begin to be withdrawn. Now, Mark. to be clear, we don't think that this withdrawal will start until Q1 of next year, but the yeah. Fed will start sending the signal over the summer. You took away my next question because that's what I was going to ask, what the actual taper would look like and when it would be executed. So, Mark, I'll build on that. Just the sequencing, some words you use. This will pave the way for rate increases. The sequence there, is it that obvious that that will be the next step in the imminent future? Well, that's what the Fed has told us recently. So this week, they started focusing a little bit more on what the path for accommodation withdrawal will look like. They stress that tapering of asset purchases will happen before they begin to raise interest rates. Now, we think that they ideally want to complete that taper. They want to stop buying uh, before they raise rates. Um, and that's still going to be some time away. We think that the taper process will likely be a year or so, uh, and that they won't start raising rates until at some point in 2023. We think the latter half of 2023. Um, so it's going to be a long path to get there. But what the market's going to care about is when the Fed starts to signal that it is moving in that direction, because the market's very quickly going to extrapolate from a Fed that is cutting its asset purchases, or at least setting the stage for that, um, and then extrapolating rate hikes at some point in the future off of that. Mark, what I'm hearing from you is higher rates ahead. What I hear from everyone, almost everyone, higher rates ahead. Looking here at 10-year yields, they are lower. They are aggressively lower on the week compared to uh, the past few weeks. What gives? Yeah. 
So look, you're, you're exactly right. Really since the start of the second quarter, since the start of April, we're down about 20 basis points on the 10 year. Um, and frankly, it has been a bit of a surprise, especially given the very robust economic data that we have seen. You're right, good retail sales report, solid CPI, and incredibly strong employment report earlier this month. So why? We think that it's essentially three factors that are driving it. One, we're starting to see some pockets of demand from foreign investors and asset managers, especially with equities at all-time highs. Two, we think that there's been likely a technical squeeze here, some short positions that got squeezed in the move and are now covering. And three, we also think that there's just an incredible amount of cash outstanding. The amount of reserves in the banking system has grown $100 billion since April. It's grown almost uh, a, a quarter, 25 or 30 percent just this year. So we've seen a lot more cash in the banking system, and that's looking for a home. This also coincides with stimulus checks that have been paid out and investors and recipients of those stimulus checks that suggest, at least to the New York Fed, that 40 percent of that money is going to be invested and saved. And that's finding its way into financial assets. So to some extent, this is a rally where everything is richening, right? Rates are declining. Equities are reaching all-time high. We know what's happening with crypto and other alternative assets. All of those are appreciating. And so we do think that the rates market is a beneficiary of some of that that's pushing rates lower. Now, importantly, what we see in the rates move is that it's really all real rate led, or the majority of it is real rate led. That's an easing of financial conditions. Um, we also anticipate that this will likely be temporary and short lived. Fundamentals will trump here. And fundamentals are going to be incredibly strong over the remainder of this year. Yep. So yep. we've been encouraging clients take this opportunity, this little rate rally, and reset your shorts because this will not likely persist. The economy is going to be really strong, inflation is going to start to pick up, and the Fed will begin to change their tune. And as all of those things happen, rates are going to move higher. Mark, with some conviction at the end there, looking forward to the conversation through the rest of this year. Mark Abana there of Bank of America Securities, the head of U.S. Rate Strategy, alongside Lisa Bramis this morning. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Good morning to you all. I'm told there's some data at 8.30 Eastern we all need to hang out for. Yes. Morgan Stanley numbers behind us. They were better than expected. The guide is decent from the CEO. We're well positioned for growth in the years ahead. But there is a $911 million loss tied to our key goss. This patch of land in northwest Saudi Arabia is going to become Neon, a city powered entirely by renewable energy. The government hopes the site, which is the size of Belgium, will be a clean energy hub, not only for the kingdom, but also the world. It's seen as at the borderline between Mission Impossible and Suicide Mission. Lucky enough, so far, we've just been on the right side of the line, yeah? But, you know, it's, it's, it's very close to that. You know, this is just smoking. This is nothing ever, ever I've seen or heard of, of the dimension, the challenge, you know? I'm not talking energy only, you know, but, but in, its, in its broadest context, including the geopolitical dimension, uh, including the cultural dimension. NEON will include a $5 billion hydrogen plant run on wind and solar energy. All of the zero carbon fuel it produces will be shipped to international buyers in the form of ammonia. When it starts operating in four years time, it will be one of the biggest hydrogen facilities in the world. 
can't explain Neo more the backup set of PowerPoints and a video clip. You just need to be here. You need to, you know, breathe it. And specifically the startup mode and, you know, things happening. The bus is all around you here. Our generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment. The politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. It's a really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. BSO Now is your online home for brand new Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. Discover new releases each week that include behind-the-scenes storytelling with conductors including music director Andres Nelsons, guest composers and musicians, plus critically acclaimed archival concerts and more. Visit bso.org forward slash now where the music plays on. BSO season sponsored by Bank of America. Once they're, in a sense, let loose, they're going to start spending. Going forward, what's going to power consumer spending is the services side of the economy, not the good side. Everything we follow would suggest every bit of inflation is being passed through and then some. The political establishment today is much more willing and, in fact, in many cases, invites higher inflation. You're going to see higher inflation and the Fed's going to, the Fed's going to be caught by surprise because it's, it's really following the wrong model. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Wrapping up earnings on Wall Street from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keen away today. Morgan Stanley, the first big bout out of the gate, the last big gap bank out of the gate this morning, Lisa, and that is it. We wrap up earnings on Wall Street with record numbers, but a headline and another discussion about Archegos. The question here, risk management, what are the practices that are entrenched in a bank and what does that mean in terms of potential execution going forward? It really is all forward looking, right? I mean, that's the idea here, and I expect a lot of questions in the call uh, in about a half an hour time about what kind of risk management uh, implementation they have. Well, here's the statement from Morgan and Stanley this morning. The current quarter includes a loss of $644 million related to a credit event for a single prime brokerage client. They go on to say $267 million in addition of subsequent trading losses through the end of the quarter related to the same event. And it's a game of guess who, Lisa, and I think we know who. Yeah, I don't think it's that much of a guess. I think everybody already put a name on it. The question here is how many more Arcaguses are there? Is this an idiosyncratic yes drink? Uh, actually, with these drinking games, do they have uh, everlasting ability when we say idiosyncratic or transitory? Are they always... An excuse to drink? John? They are always an excuse to drink. <laughs> At least if it's Friday. I've got a good friend with a bow tie who right now is in bed drinking. <laughs> well, I'm glad that Tom is watching Keith this show. Is watching. Me. Is he? Yes. Oh, I'm sure He's he has lots of nice things. He's enjoying a beverage things. of his choice, let me tell you. <laughs> let me get to the price action this Friday morning. Good morning to you all. Wrapping up a really, really long week for many of you on Wall Street. We've had the bank earnings, the data, CPI, retail sales as well. And at times today, I can hardly speak. Equity futures, 41.70 on the S&P 500, up by around about two tenths of a 1%. We advance by seven or eight points. Into the bond market we go at 156.40 on tens. Yields again, Lisa, just in by a basis point or so. And this has got to be one of the standout stories of the week so far. The data and how this bond market has responded to it. I, to me, I, what I was thinking about when Mark Cabana was talking is this idea, all of the cash in bank accounts, which has really been one of the main stories coming out of bank earnings, has gone into financial assets, including bonds. What happens when people withdraw that cash to actually spend it? What happens to rates? Are we going to get this sort of boom economy with an even higher yield? I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But this idea of people using cash in the real world rather than financial markets, what the implications of that will you be? You throw a lot out there, don't you, just in case it does happen, and then you can say you said it. 
I've noticed that. Just That's not the just, reason just why I'm around, saying it. But I'm not trying to be right. Bearish scenario. I'm trying to look there. around look the around. entire potential oh. scenario. I'm not throwing things out there to With be a clear right. Bias to the downside. To the clear bias to the scenarios that have been less counted mm. in markets. Okay. I'll take it. I'll run with it. Morgan Stanley, that's your big story this morning. Burned by a $911 million hit on the Archegos blow up. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, the other side of this story is record numbers. Yes. Let's bring in Shanali Basak, Bloomberg Wall Street correspondent. Shanali, this is the problem for these right. banks. They post these record numbers, then no one talks about them because we're so used to seeing record numbers from these big banks on Wall Street. Yeah, that, that's for sure. It's been you know many quarters now of just really amazing results, both in trading and investment banking. But you know, when it comes to Morgan Stanley, you know, we're still trying to absorb what $911 million means in terms of a loss tied to a single client. Uh, to what extent will James Gorman say what David Solomon over at Goldman Sachs had said, that these kinds of events uh, can happen in the future, right? Are we still concerned about excessive leverage and excessive risk taking? Morgan Stanley, you know, th that kind of commentary matters a little more because they're a bigger prime brokerage. They actually are bigger in equities typically and, and bigger in prime brokerage. But this quarter around, you know, I'm already actually getting text messages, as you said, from, from their clients. <laughs> and what they are saying is $911 million is larger than what was expected, but very small relative to their revenue base, right? Well, they have Sh very loyal clients. Shanali, that's exactly where I wanted to go. The traders in the market, both in the financial market side, trading financials, as well as people who do business with Morgan Stanley, yeah. is the $911 million headline the one that they're focusing on, or are they looking to something else to determine the strength and the potential momentum behind Morgan Stanley? Well, let's ask something else that we've been asking for weeks now. It's why did Morgan Stanley lose $911 million and Goldman did not? What's the difference in risk management, the way they offloaded the stock? Uh, I think it's it's not quite clear the difference in how this was handled among the two firms. The other question then becomes, what does this mean for clients moving forward, a broader array of clients that um, have sought a lot of leverage, especially for um, those you know, concentrated long-only bets? James Gorman has been very generous with his time over the years with this network. We'd love to catch up with him again soon. I'm sure, Shanali, that would be fantastic to hear from the man himself about what's been going on and why that difference, too. Shanali, thank you. Shanali Basak there, our Wall Street correspondent, off the back of those numbers from Morgan Stanley. As I said a little bit earlier, it's been like a horse race trying to cover the stock coverage side of the story. We're down by 1.7% now, Morgan Stanley. Goldman Sachs, slightly positive. For the broader equity market, up by two-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Lisa has just been record high after record high, and we've Got another one on the screen on the Bloomberg this morning. Yeah, it's, it's, it is exhausting. It's sort of like, well, another record high. It's sunny and beautiful and 75 again. I mean, there is a question of, are we getting too perfect? And I think that that is some of the nervousness that you see in the horse race this morning where it's hard to gauge uh, where we are. And that is a question. Yes, we have analyst expectations that are high for these companies. They are beating, and then the shares don't do much because that means that the expectations baked into valuations is that much higher, John. You can't help it, can you? Lisa and I don't sit right next to each other, but she can see me laughing out uh -huh. the corner of her eye. Of course. A thing's too perfect. Brent Shuley joins <laughs> us now, Northwestern Mutual Chief Investment Strategist. True to form. Brent, let's ask the question that Bank of America asked earlier this week, and I do think it's an important one. Does a boom economy mean a boom market? Yes. And so I, I agree that things appear to be too perfect right now, but you're kind of in a Goldilocks period, and I hate saying that because it's always the famous last words, but you have strong economic growth, you're likely to continue to have strong economic growth. Uh, but on the too perfect question, I do think that's starting to seep in because if you think about it, for the past year or so, monetary and fiscal policy have been pushing in one direction. There's always been a commentary of doing more. No comment about who would pay for it or if we got too much of it. And now you're starting to have that commentary about the future seep in. Does the strong economic growth mean the cycle ends a little bit quicker? Does it mean that we have actually have inflation, which we have to worry about? And so I do think that's a governor on returns in the future because the market does discount the current and the future. And you're starting to see conversation about tax hikes, so a little bit less fiscal policy. You're starting to see conversations about the Fed potentially starting to tighten. But I still think those are far off in the future, are far enough off in the future that the market can move higher. And I, I agree with you all about the market going up on a daily basis, but I do think underneath that top level, it's a cyclical one day versus uh, defensives the next day. And so yesterday was more defensives. Today might be more cyclical. Uh, but I do still think cyclical sectors and asset classes win the day moving forward. Brent, you touched on something so important. It's the speed of this cycle and how quickly things are moving. The duration of the cycle is something that has 
come onto a lot of people's minds over the last few months, and I think Morgan Stanley's helped lead that effort, shorter, hotter kind of cycle. Do you still think it's too early to even think about conceptually what this cycle looks like? No, I mean, I'm always thinking ahead, and I think one of the things that you've seen over the past you know, 30 years of the Fed is that they've moderated the business cycle. That's what gradual rate hikes were intended to do, uh, and they did it very well from 1990 on. If you look back before the 90s, you saw more erratic business cycles. Uh, if you think about the Fed's forecast now, they are outcome-based, not outlook-based, and they're not going to tighten anything before things are too hot. And so potentially, if you think about it, that could mean a more erratic end to a business cycle or a more erratic business cycle. And so certainly, I do expect this cycle to be shorter, um, but that still is a ways off in the future, and I'm not worried about that quite yet. One reason why I keep trying to poke holes in optimism is not because I'm a Debbie Downer, uh, necessarily, maybe I am, but there is also this idea, what are we missing, right? Because there is a strong consensus of this growth. There's a strong optimism that is justified by the data. The question is, do you hedge, or is the best hedge going further into risk? Because that's where the gains have been, and if there's inflation, potentially riskier assets will do better. What's your view? Is there a hedge? Do you want to even be trying to at this point? Yes, there is a hedge, and there's always a hedge. And to me, the only way this cycle ends prematurely is if we get permanent inflation that causes the Fed to eventually flinch. And so if you think about my comment in that way, th there's no cost to monetary or fiscal policy right now. And policymakers are going to do more. Society wants it. Uh, and so I, I don't foresee any extreme tightening of any sort. And if we had a fourth wave as something backed away, we would probably get more support. The only thing that changes that narrative to me is if we get rising inflation that causes that narrative to change. And that is something that I think investors should hedge for. Look, to, to me, every investor that I talk to wants their portfolio all to go in one direction. I think professionals who do this for a living realize that we don't know for certain. And to me, if you think the one side of the distribution is covered by the Fed and policymakers, you need to cover the other side. And so while we do have an equity overweight, we do own tips, we do own commodities and think that investors should as a just in case, kind of during that time period where stocks and bonds move, move in the same direction. Just a final question from me, Brent. If I own commodities and we start to see inflation and the Fed has to make a move, do I want to own commodities in that environment? Well, I think it's more of a timing perspective then. So I think um, the Fed won't move until they absolutely have to. And the Fed isn't moving until all those people come back into the labor force and actually are hired. And so inflation is going to rise in the near term, which means it's going to be a ballast for commodities. Um, but at some point, you're right. I mean, then you start pricing in the end of the cycle and then things start moving lower based upon that future outlook. But I think that's still off in the future. But I think the Fed, which I think a lot of investors are missing, it is not going to focus on the inflation mandate like they did for the past 40 years. They're going to focus on the employment mandate and they're going to focus on employment at all levels. And so I, that's where I still think you have time left. And inflation may rise in the near term, but the Fed isn't flinching uh, until it gets to be so uncomfortable that they have to. Brent, smart, sharp, good to catch up. Brent Schutte there, Northwestern Mutual Chief Investment Strategist. Your broader equity market with a lift up two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. We advance around about nine points, 41.71 on the S&P, an all-time high in yesterday's session. Session. And once again, we're set for the opening bout to see another one, another record high in the United States of America in this equity market. In the bond market, yields come in a couple of basis points, down two to 155.52. In the FX market, euro dollar 119.85, up a little more than a tenth of 1%. And crude doing okay. We're back to a 63 handle on WTI, $63 and about 56 cents. We advance a little more than a tenth of 1%. We have wrapped up earnings season on Wall Street, and we're looking ahead now from the big banks to big tech over the next several weeks. Equity futures, positive. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Ritika Gupta. There was a mass shooting last night at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. According to police, eight people were killed, and at least five others were hospitalized. Authorities say the shooter killed himself. The FedEx operation is located near the Indianapolis airport. It's not clear whether the shooter worked there. In China, there's not been an economic rebound quite like this one. First quarter GDP rising a record 18.3% from a year ago. But you've got to remember here, that's when the economy was shut down in an attempt to control this coronavirus pandemic. China's economy improving only slightly from the fourth quarter of 2020. Consumer spending had lagged during the early stages of the recovery, but it's picked up in the first quarter. In Hong Kong, media tycoon and pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai has been sentenced 
14 months in prison. Lai was convicted of attending two unauthorized protests. He also was charged with more national security offenses. Authorities have been pursuing cases against Hong Kong's most high-profile dissidents. The European Union probably will not renew its coronavirus vaccine contracts with AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. That's according to France's industry minister. Both vaccines have been linked to rare blood clots. The EU's already started talks about contracts with BioNTech, Pfizer and Moderna. Global News 24 hours today on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Minority myth wasn't something that was fabricated by the Asian Americans. It was created as a tool to alienate the Black and the Asian American communities, and it was incredibly successful. We know the racism didn't begin yesterday. We know it's probably not going to end tomorrow, but it is our job to make sure that there's progress and we keep people safe, give people dignity. And I spent a lot of time last year to just listen, to understand, to reflect and understand what I could do as, as a leader of this organization. For many years, we've been very shareholder focused, and now there really is much more of a community requirement. The economic downturn in the U.S., we're seeing unemployment and income losses affecting women more than men. Two thirds of the jobs lost in South Africa were women's jobs. So I think we're in a moment of crisis. Clearly our societies are reproducing, not producing inequality. We need better public policy and we need companies to step up. that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. After Labor Day, we'll, you know, we'll be back to you know, generally moving towards uh, being back to normal. Between now and then, it'll be partial. But the key is, then you flip it. For 
the good of cities and towns and stuff, we, you know, as those people who are vaccinated come back to work and go to restaurants, that'll just be good for the vibrancy of downtown. So in Charlotte, you know, I was talking to another CEO today, they, they, you know, we need to get the people commuting downtown and, and then the restaurants and downtown life can come back which, and the great cities need that. Brian Moynihan there, the Bank of America chairman and CEO on the return to normal. In New York City and beyond, down in Charlotte, too. From New York City this morning, this is Bloomberg. Alongside Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane on vacation today. Let's get to the price action of this Friday morning as we take you towards the weekend. Equity's doing better than good over the last six months or so. We're up another nine points on the S&P 500. We advanced there by two-tenths of 1%. Into the bond market, yields come in by a couple of basis points to 155.87. On euro dollar, 119.85, down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Just to talk about New York, just briefly, Lisa, if you try to get a restaurant reservation over the weekend, Friday, Saturday, it is almost impossible are at you the moment. Are you going inside? It is buzzing. I've been inside a couple of times. All right. Well, I mean, honestly, if you look at the streets, you can feel it coming back. You can feel people trying to get back to a normal, but it doesn't feel the same. I was just saying that I feel like I'm visiting a former life that has been put through the twilight zone, John. You've got to reclaim your former life. DC, you've got to reclaim it. Oh, yeah? Stop waiting to be told that we can take it back and just go off going. script here. I'm not <laughs> going to do it. I'm it's not going to talk. Almost the weekend. Carry let's, on. Let's talk about the airlines. We can do that <laughs> with Helene Becker, Cowan Senior <laughs> Research Analyst. Helene, there's three worlds right now in your world. We've got the business world, we've got international travel, and then we've got leisure. And they all look different, don't they? Can you just walk through them one by one? Yes, good morning, and thanks for having me, team. Um, so business travel is kind of a tale of two businesses, one or maybe three. One is small and medium-sized companies that have never really left. Those folks, they're the folks who need revenue, so they are traveling. Then there's corporate business, and that hasn't come back yet, maybe a little bit. But in general, if you're a big corporation, sales tend to come to you. You don't have to go out and get them. And then there's conferences, which I notice are starting to come back. I'm going to one this weekend, an aviation conference that starts, um, I think, Monday. And then um, World of Concrete is apparently the first conference in June that's returning to Las Vegas. So that's coming back. So that's the business side. Then you have international, and there's, again, two different worlds. One is our hemisphere, where I think as Americans are getting vaccinated, they feel more comfortable traveling. So they're going to the Caribbean. They're going, they're going to beach destinations and mountains and outdoor things, Latin American beach destinations, Mexico. Um, I mentioned the Caribbean. And a lot of the big resort hotels are making it very easy for Americans to test before they go back to the United States because we still have to test even if you're vaccinated before you come back. And the airports are doing the same. So that makes it relatively easy. And then there's Europe, which is, I think, four to six months behind us. And then Asia, which is probably a year behind us. I don't see Asia coming back really until um, mid-2022 at the earliest. And even Europe, fourth quarter maybe. And then there's leisure, domestic leisure. And I think domestic leisure is at least 90 to 95% of the way back. And I think those million and a half people we see traveling every day, roughly, somewhere between a million two and a million five, um, I think about a million, um, I would think all but 150 or 200,000 of them are leisure. Amazing. And I know, right? It's, it's pretty amazing that people feel really comfortable traveling. And as they get vaccinated, they're doing things. You, I was listening to you guys talk about, you know, going back to restaurants and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, if I got vaccinated and I'm out of my two-week window that from because I got, you know, the uh, one vaccine with two shots then why am I still in paradise prison? Why can't I go out and start my next, I said my next normal as opposed to reclaiming my life. But why can't I start doing the things that I used to do before I got locked down? Yeah, Helene, I got to say, it is almost trying to make us feel bad for being at work and not on those Caribbean <laughs> beaches and the fantastic destinations that you're talking about. A lot of people want to go places. There's a question about the airlines and whether they can meet demand, given how yes. many people they have to bring back into the offices and bring back to their airplanes. I know that Delta had an issue with not having enough pilots, not having enough flight attendants, and they had to cancel flights. Are you hearing difficulties uh, around this? And with respect to that, are they raising some of the wages in response? Um, so there's a lot of questions in there. And 
one of the issues Delta had, and, and I don't know that this is an excuse, but it's what they said, <laughs> is that um, a lot of their pilots were able to get vaccinated and the FAA doesn't let you fly within 48 hours of getting vaccinated, so they had to cancel flights. You would just think they would have timed that a little bit better so it didn't happen over Easter weekend. Um, as far as wage rates, I want to tackle that because I think it's really important. The big three airlines, American, Delta, and United, all have open pilot contracts. And um, we think wages at the starting level are definitely going to go up. I'm not 100% certain that wages at the top end will go up more than a few dollars an hour. But when the pandemic hit really hard a year ago, and it was exactly a year ago that traffic bottomed at that 87, 85,000 a day level, and I said we're now back to a million five, um, the airlines worked with their employees to try to get anybody who was thinking about retiring between, say, 2020 and 2023 to think about retiring last year. Some of the airlines worked with their people to cut hours so they didn't have to furlough as many people. I mean, one thing to consider for pilots, it's always last in, first out, which means they would have had to furlough a lot of pilots at the lower end of the pay scale and at the lesser seniority level versus keeping those pilots and asking older pilots who are kind of 62 to 65, well, mandatory retirement age is 65 anyway, but pilots in their 60s to think about retiring earlier or working fewer hours to keep more people on the payroll yeah. so that when we recover, we're ready to rock and roll as opposed to having issues as, you know, I'm hearing there are issues in some other service sectors. Well, they're rocking and rolling for some yeah. of these airlines right now. Helene, Fantastic to catch up with you. You're not just an analyst. I know how much you care about this industry as well, and it's good to see it back on its feet. Helene Becker there, Thanks. Cowan, senior research analyst. And Lisa, it's not just about looking at the TSA numbers and comparing to where we are last year. It's trying to get inside them and trying to work out where the boom is. And right now it's domestic leisure, and that is booming again. Yeah, the question is how much can that actually drive airline revenues, airline uh, occupancy to the levels that we saw previously? When does business travel get back when online? When is international, Lisa? Exactly. Well, I mean, that goes together, right? I mean, those are in tandem. And without that, how can these airlines really get back to where they were, especially given the debt overhang that they have? And yes, you can laugh that I'm bringing up the I'm, negative. I'm but not laughing. It's, it's a smiling. true issue. I'm just excited about the weekend. Lisa tells me that it, about five minutes there's some data I've got to hang out for, so I'll do just that. Are you going to jump Five after that. I'm just going to run away afterwards. <laughs> now, I've got to catch up with Shanali Basak as well. It's going to bring us a, a little bit of news around Morgan Stanley that I'm looking forward to as well. Morgan Stanley recovering from the losses of this morning. We're down just a mild move, off by four-tenths of one percent on Morgan Stanley's stock. From New York City this morning, good morning. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane back with us on Monday. Equities all-time highs, 41.70 on the S&P 500, up two-tenths of one percent. Into the bond market, yields were a little bit lower, now basically unchanged at 156. This is Bloomberg.
from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning to you all. Alongside Lisa Bramage, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane back with us on Monday. It is the moment you've been waiting for. I can't even say it with a straight face. Here we go. Housing starts month on month. 19.4%. Upside surprise. Whoa. The number we were looking for, the median estimate, 13.5% for housing starts. Building permits month on month, 2.7%. Median estimate, 1.7%. So we had an upside surprise on CPI, blowout number on retail sales, on housing starts, Lisa. And I have to say, I know I'm playing it down, I'm just joking. It's been a massive, massive sector for this economy over the last 12 months. And housing starts up 19.4% month on month in the month of March. Just highlighting this lack of inventory to meet the demand. Demand so far outstripping what we see in terms of supplies for the housing market. The builders are going to meet that demand. Question here for lumber prices. Are they going to shoot even higher after increasing yeah. so dramatically? Question here for a lot of commodities and question for uh, whether this is actually a good sign for the banks given the fact that people will have to take out mortgages to buy some of these homes. That sector has been absolutely flying over the last year, that's for sure. We'll turn back to that data in just a moment. I need to turn back to Morgan Stanley just briefly. The stock has turned almost positive. We are positive now in the pre-market by a couple of tenths of 1%. Shanali Basak has been standing by through the morning, through the last couple of days going over the big bank numbers. Shanali, just go through some of what you're hearing at the moment around Morgan Stanley off the back of the numbers this morning. Yeah, it's very important, John, because the big question here is with the hit almost a billion dollars on Arkegos, how much is this going to impact Morgan Stanley, the biggest prime brokerage in the world? Our sources are now telling us that this is a once in a two decade event for Morgan Stanley. That's the last time they've seen a ma major credit event like this in their prime brokerage. They are not planning major changes or ma major overhauls in that prime brokerage unit, which should be uh, a nice uh, piece of news for the hedge fund community. Uh, they plan to address this on the call. My questions still remain. Does James Gorman really see this as a complete one-off event, given the exuberance we're seeing in the market? Another interesting thing we can expect from James Gorman heading up in this call right now uh, is now that they have E-Trade under their wing, how is he viewing that retail trading exuberance in relation to what's happening in institutional markets? Shinali, before you go, just compare and contrast how the likes of Nomura and Credit Suisse have responded to the same issue compared to what you're hearing from Morgan Stanley. Well, what's interesting is Morgan Stanley was pretty quick to sell, kind of like Goldman Sachs had been. Morgan Stanley, according to our sources, was also the biggest prime brokerage to Arkegos. So in theory, they would have had the biggest exposure to Arkegos, but their losses were limited to $911 million. By the way, John, if you add that number back, I was told this is contra revenue. If you add that back to that equities trading number, they would have been bigger than Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan in the quarter. One last thing on that $2,966 billion in fixed income trading revenue, uh, two years ago, that would have been a mind-blowing for Morgan Stanley. So yeah. it's interesting to see that number come back up. We've been desensitized by some of these record figures right. from some of these banks this week. Shanali, fantastic week for you. Let me just say that. Shanali Basak, our Wall Street correspondent on some of the big bank earnings so far this week. Morgan Stanley stock up by a third of 1%. Let's take it back from the bank numbers this morning and take it back to the data. Housing starts month on month in America up 19.4%. What a blowout number against the median estimate of 13.5. Let's turn to Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence for some reaction to this number. Ira, your take. Yeah, obviously a good number. It's consistent with a lot of the headline numbers that we've seen. Now, remember that the fact that these are housing starts doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to necessarily be housing sales three to six months from now. They should be. You would expect that to be given uh, the strength in the housing market. But with you know interest rates moving a, a little bit higher, housing affordability is not what it was, say, three or four months ago. Ira, we've seen a good data point after good data point come out in the economy, and yet bonds have continued to rally. What do you make of that? So, so I think there's a few things. Firstly, you know, you talk about some of these headline numbers being uh, being good. You know, retail sales, you know, close to 10 percent. But when you look at some of the core data, whether it's core inflation or uh, core retail sales, so what we call the control group, which is the input to GDP, that was pretty much as expected. And and I think some people were certainly leaning short in rates and thinking that yields would continue to go higher because we'd get numbers even better than what were expected, particularly in the in those core numbers. Um, so, so that was number one. Number two. 
too, um, you did have a lot of people leaning short, particularly in yield curve steepeners. So thinking the long end interest rates were going to go up more than short term. And we saw a lot of closeouts of those kind of trades yesterday, particularly in the derivatives market. Um, so, so you had a lot of technical factors. Now, I don't think that the rally is going to last very long. Um, we're looking at you know 147 to 150 to kind of be the floor in 10-year yields at this point. Um, so, uh, so, so you know, we'd be fading this rally uh, if uh, if we do get a little bit more of it today. All right, it's good to see you as always. What a week, Cara Jersey, Bloomberg Intelligence Chief, U.S. Rate Strategist. Let's bring in Stephen Stanley, our most upon Chief Economist. Stephen, what a week. We can take a deep breath and move on to the weekend soon. Your take on the data so far right. this week, Stephen? Sure. Well, pretty much every high-profile March uh, economic indicator has been far stronger than expected, going all the way back to the ISM and employment numbers in the prior week, but certainly the retail sales numbers yesterday and now the housing starts numbers today. I think in some ways it was a perfect storm in March because February you had the bad weather, particularly as it relates to housing starts, which would have depressed a lot of the February data. And I think March for housing starts at least was a catch-up uh, based on the weather, but certainly the market, the housing market continues to be extremely strong and builders are going to be uh, playing catch-up for a long time. So, you know, the, the more starts they can get under their belts, uh, the better it is for the market. Stephen, one trait of this recovery has just been how quickly things are moving. As an economist, how difficult are you finding it just to keep up? Yeah, you have to be nimble. I mean, you, usually when you're doing your GDP tracking estimates, they might move by one or two or three tenths when a particular number comes out. But you get a number like retail sales yesterday, and all of a sudden you're revising by one, two, three percentage points, depending on what your forecast was going in. And I think, um, you know, that's something that, that I think relates to the Fed as well, because the Fed has this thought in their head that they're going to be able to move very slowly and just kind of you know, inch their way back toward normal on policy. But if the economy continues to gain ground at the speed that we're seeing right now, then things may play out quite a bit differently. Among the economic mysteries of the week has been bank earnings and the lack of loan demand. A lot of uh, banks and executives there are saying this is actually a good thing. It's because there's so much cash that people are spending that and paying down their debt. So they'll be that much more ready to spend later on. Do you view it the same way or are there signs of caution within the lack of loan demand? No, I think it's a function of the fact that people are people and corporations at this point are very flush. I mean, the, the household sector has been uh, has gotten three rounds of rebate checks, uh, very generous unemployment benefits, and if you look at the personal income numbers and the savings rate, there's no reason for people to borrow. The only reason that people are going to have to borrow really is, as you as you mentioned before, is is home mortgages. Uh, on the corporate side, it's kind of the same thing. We saw this blowout in uh, corporate bond issuance last year and into, and into this year. And I think most companies are, are pretty flush with cash right now and sitting on that cash and waiting to deploy it. So there's really not much need for a lot of borrowing at this point, uh, except for you know specific sectors like home mortgages and maybe you know student loans and a few other things. So how do you determine, Stephen, if we've got enough momentum to keep this pace of spending up, perhaps on a credit line, rather than just using cash beyond the next two quarters or whatever it is to, uh, to wear down some of this cash? Well, there are various numbers that you can look at. Obviously, the savings rate comes out every month. Uh, the, the Fed puts out quarterly data on, um, you know, household financial assets and, and things like that. And those data indicate that, that consumers are just flush right now, uh, a lot of money. And that was even before uh, this latest round of rebate checks. So I think it's going to take a while uh, for consumers to uh, plow through that stockpile. And I think they've been saving up to do all the fun stuff that we haven't been able to do for the last year, travel and, uh, you know, go out to events uh, and things like that. And so I think there's certainly going to be kind of this one-off, you know, blowout uh, period where people are, you know, everybody's trying to take a vacation at the same time. Everybody's trying to go to the same concerts and ball games and all the rest. Uh, and then you know, once the dust starts to settle, we'll see where we are at that point. Stephen, we've got to talk about the shift in the reaction function of the Fed, the shift in the framework. It's a framework that would have been perfect for the previous cycle, would have made a load of sense. Does it make sense for this one? Well, I, you know, I think it all depends on how inflation plays out, right? Because they, what they've said basically is they want to wait to see the whites of the eyes of inflation. And again, I mean, the Fed has conceded that we're going to get this uh, short-term pop in prices, but then they think things are going to, you know, pop, go right back into place at or below 2%. Um, if inflation gets well above their target and stays there for more than a few months, 
then I think, you know, at that point, the react, the new reaction function probably looks a lot like the old one would have. Um, if, if inflation remains very benign, then I think they're going to be extremely dovish and wait a long time. Uh, but they may or may not have that luxury, depending on how prices behave. Stephen, can we call it the weekend now? Are we done? I think we're done, aren't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Get, I'm still here. Thank you. Stephen Stanley, Amherst Pierpont. <laughs> so are you, John. Chief economist. <laughs> Just getting people on site, Lisa. <laughs> okay, great. You're going to throw off we're your done. mic. We're done. I'm not going to throw it off just yet. I've got another program to do, and I'll be doing that with BlackRock's Global Chief Investment Strategist, Wei Lee. Looking forward to catching well up done. with her. Looking forward to catching up with Erin Brown of PIMCO. Ashish Shah of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Michael Purvis of Tallback, and we'll do all of that in the next hour. Lisa, what a week it's been. It has Retail been. Retail sales, CPI, and there's your bond market, 157.45 on tens. Yeah, and also bank earnings. Don't forget those. I mean, it was a really wild week as we try to assess whether we've actually priced in too much optimism or not enough optimism into earnings and really kicking off uh, a season that'll be interesting. The dynamic, though, and this is really key, we don't know what happens, how long this cycle lasts, right? This idea of how long can we see this boom? Is yeah. it going to be short, or is that short boom going to drive enough momentum to carry into quarters beyond? Well, let's take a seat on the Investment Committee of Hindsight Capital just briefly. That's uh, Mr. Weissenthal saying Hindsight Capital. Let's get on that Investment Committee right now and think about it. I'd love it. to. Biggest risk over the last 12 months clearly was upside risk and we just weren't positioned enough for it. And I don't think economists were optimistic enough either. Clearly, the balance of those risks, Lisa, have shifted now. Now we've had economics expectations come through so much higher over the last six months. The other hindsight capital management committee uh, note would be about the dollar and this idea that the dollar would weaken substantially and that the reflation trade would be global in nature. It has not been as much. It has been concentrated on the United States and now a really big question going into this next couple of quarters is do we see it gain traction over in Europe and in, developing the, in the developing world or are we going to stay in the United States? Just minting money at hindsight capital. Just fantastic work. Lisa, <laughs> good to catch up. Good to see you. Great week. Thank you. Thank you. Take Lisa care. will continue Happy the program. Weekend. I'm going to run away for the weekend. You might see me doing another program in about an hour and maybe a little bit later as well. I don't know how present I will be <laughs> from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Ritka Gupta. There's been another mass shooting in the U.S. This time it happened in Indianapolis, where a gunman opened fire last night at a FedEx facility near the airport. Eight people were killed and at least five others were hospitalized. Police say the shooter killed himself. It's not known if the gunman was an employee at FedEx. In Vienna, Iran says it has enriched uranium close to levels needed to make a weapon. That adds to the obstacles diplomats are trying to overcome as they try to revive that 2015 nuclear agreement. Iran is demanding that the U.S. lift sanctions before it agreed to rejoin the treaty. It will be all about China today when President Biden meets with Japan's Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. This will be the president's first in-person meeting with a foreign leader since taking office. China's shadow will loom large over almost every topic. The two are expected to discuss human rights, Taiwan and supply chains amongst other issues. And China criticized the U.S. record on global warming today. It happened whilst climate envoy John Kerry was in Shanghai seeking greater cooperation on the issue. The Chinese foreign ministry said the U.S. is responsible for the world not reaching climate change targets set by the Paris Agreement in 2015. President Biden is trying to reestablish the U.S. as a leader on global climate action. Citigroup is planning a big expansion in Hong Kong. The bank plans to hire more than 300 wealth managers there in the next five years and double its assets under management. That comes as we heard Citi announce plans to exit retail banking in 13 markets across Asia and Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Revenues coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. We're early on in this year. I know we've already sort of penciled in six or seven percent growth and a big fall in unemployment, but under outcome based policy, we really want to see that. I'm bullish on the rebound, but I know we have a long way to go before the job is complete. There's no textbook for this. You don't want to be too preemptive, but I also don't want to be so reactive that we're late. I think it's too early to talk about uh, changing monetary policy while we're still in the pandemic tunnel. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. The United States is not looking to kick off a cycle of, ex of escalation and conflict with Russia. We want a stable, predictable relationship. If Russia continues to interfere with our democracy, I'm prepared to take further actions to respond. President Biden, as he engages in a more aggressive foreign policy, it starts to take shape. We get a sense of what the world may look like, at least the relationship with the United States under President Biden. We also got a look at what the relationship might be with the Kremlin as there were sanctions put on Russia. Question here, was this really that harsh or was this just the beginning? Daniel Tannenbaum joins it now. Oliver Wyman, partner and head of America's anti-financial crime unit. I'm curious from your perspective, Dan, of whether these these sanctions were harsh and unexpected or perhaps too light given some of the potential uh, allegations here. Thanks, Lisa. And as, as Nick Wadhams and others reported last week, you know, these sanctions were known to be coming in response to the solar winds hack and election meddling and, and as it's described, other malign activities by Russia. Um, I think what these sanctions looked like were a bit unclear coming into the announcement yesterday in terms of how severe they would be. It's pretty clear that this was a, a proper opening salvo and, and no attempt for a knockout punch. Also, th these sanctions were, were quite explicitly responsive to just the hacking issues. You still have Nord Stream 2 lingering out there. You still have issues related to Alexei Navalny, as well as the Russian military buildup on the Ukrainian border. So there's still a whole other range of issues that the U.S. could begin to push harder against on Russia. And I think this was just the warning shot. Well, and you certainly saw that in markets. I mean, you're seeing a bounce back today in the ruble uh, now gaining versus the dollar. People seemed unfazed when it came to even sovereign debt, even though you did get a, sort of a bar from some of the banks uh, engaging with these securities. What could potentially disrupt markets that seems like a realistic escalation between the U.S. and with, with Russia? Yeah, and, and I think we've seen an evolution of securities trading related activity restrictions since 2014 with the beginning of some of the debt and equity restrictions after uh, Crimea was annexed by Russia. What we saw yesterday, and again, a, a buildup after 2019 sanctions that restricted 
trading in non-ruble denominated sovereign debt um, is really, this is only impacting primary market trades. So secondary market trades on Russian sovereign debt, be it in euro, be it in ruble, are still permissible on the secondary market. And I think Treasury knew that this would have a muted impact, not kind of an adverse issue similar to when the oligarch sanctions were dropped in 2018 and you saw a brief destabilization of the aluminum industry. So I think certainly you could touch upon greater restrictions and access to capital more broadly if you expand to the secondary market. I think it's very clear that the touch of just the primary market was only going to have a very limited response. Dan, I want to zoom out a little bit and go to something that Jeannie Zeno was talking about earlier as she talked about... Hello, traders. This president Let's place an order to sell short euro. I'm looking to sell euro at 119.82.8. Okay? Okay, I'm placing an order to sell short 119.82.8. Let's see, you still have time, so if you want to trade euro against United States dollar, um, you can place order to sell short. Okay, I'll speak to you later, guys. We understand the productivity, the unforeseen consequences. I think the team that's been assembled at State, Treasury, and the National Security Apparatus have been experienced from the Bush and Obama administration, some from the Trump administration. And they know how to look around the corner to see the unforeseen, constantly unanticipated consequences. That being said, I think the market is still nervous. Friends of mine in multinational FIs, um, they're doing the analysis to see how these type of moves will ruin their days, much like some of the Chinese security restrictions ruined their Christmas break in December. Well, one reason why I love speaking with you, Dan, is because you do have this bird's eye view in what companies are thinking in their risk offices in terms of charting some sort of strategy. How do they get ahead of different administrations? And what's their main concern right now with the Biden administration about where the potential sanctions could come, where they could potentially be restricted going forward? So I think where, what we see with this administration is certainly less unpredictability than what we've been seeing over the last four years. In particular, I think if you see some of the appointees of the Biden administration, them coming from a more mature sanctions and national security regime of the past, they know how to engage with institutions. So for some of these significant moves, um, you'll see Treasury reaching out to institutions in advance so they can prepare them. Um, we saw this with Libya a number of years ago where banks were notified in advance. So I think the institutions I work with take comfort that they know there's a certain maturity in how the Biden administration approaches these issues, and there's not going to be certain knee-jerk reactions that really disrupt the reaction in any sort of unforeseen way. There's also a question, though, internationally, and Dan, I know this is sensitive and it might be uh, something you don't want to weigh in on, but there was a fascinating story about how international banks are losing market share in some of the biggest Asian markets, whether it's in China, whether it's in India. And this has to do with the close relationship of local firms with the governments, as well as restrictions that have been placed on them. How concerned are your clients about that, about pushback and a lack of comp competitive advantage overseas, bringing them more closely to the domestic economy. I, I'm living and breathing this issue almost every day. I think you've seen China respond with certain counter sanctions that essentially create a significant conflict of law issue for global banks operating in the U.S. and China. And essentially, it's forcing choice. You've already seen some global banks have picked China as they've repositioned senior leadership into Hong Kong and greater China area. So I do see a lot of nervousness for how China could react to try and replicate some of what the U.S. has done to bring foreign institutions um, to really bend the knee towards the U.S. I think now you have a real threat to that going forward if China tries to exert those authorities they've granted themselves. Does this nervousness represent itself as retrenchment or is it simply just wariness? I think it's wariness, although you are seeing potential moves of retrenchment as the businesses look to organize themselves going forward. Do you see Okay, something? guys, position Decisions. open on Euro at 119. 82, we managed to open 82.9. Okay, a bit higher. Okay, 119, 82.9, position open. It's short position. If you uh, decided to trade Euro, 
Well done. Uh, you infiltrate. Stay with me, and I'll lead you. I'll let you know when we're going to sell and when we're going to make a profit. Stay safe. Is absolutely right. Getting us to the weekend. This question about the foreign policy angle of President Biden tied with earnings from the big banks. Absolutely blowout. And yet in markets, there was a bit of a shrug. What have you done for me lately? What do you plan to do for me next quarter? And then, of course, incredible stats when it came to retail sales in the markets. You're seeing stocks respond. Bonds, not so much to the optimism. With stocks uh, nearing all-time highs yet again, new highs every day. Bond yields heading lower, though, as people talk. 0.585%. Coming up, perhaps a view on Bitcoin from the former SEC chair Harvey Pitt. From New York, this is Bloomberg. biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the UN, we did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Wrapping up the week at all-time highs from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is the countdown to the open. The countdown to the open starts right now. 30 minutes away from the opening bell. Let's get straight to it. We begin with the big issue. Is this as good as it gets? The recovery 
undoubtedly is just rock solid off the charts. We all know the economy is reopening. We've now got some really powerful economic growth coming through. This economic data for March is almost breathtaking. The data has been uh, continuing to surprise. This blowout retail sales. Retail sales that were significantly better than expected. Market dominance is about expectation. This market's going to go a lot higher. It just keeps coming. Everything's happening at warp speed. Just when you think things are frothy, they get frothier. Yields on the 10-year Treasury actually falling a bit. Treasury is effectively taking a breath. What you've seen is kind of the rate market stabilized. It's very hard to see what takes the economy down. And this is now really the point at which the strong growth outlook becomes fact rather than forecast. It's almost as if it just can't get any better than this. Can't it? Let's bring in the Bloomberg team. Carl Riccadonna, Kelly Lyons. Carl, let's start right there. Are you surprised by how quickly we're having this conversation about maybe this is as good as it gets? Well, John, uh, I don't think this is as good as it gets by any stretch. Uh, we've got uh, employment running about 8.5, 8.4 million below uh, where it was prior to the pandemic starting. Uh, women's participation in the labor force is uh, back at levels last seen in the Jimmy Carter administration. Uh, so it may be the fastest growth rate we're going to see uh, over the next uh, couple of months, but uh, I don't think this is as good as it gets by any stretch. Uh, also, uh, I, I want to push back against a, a point that was made uh, on your program earlier in the morning. Uh, this notion of this being such a, a short and hot cycle, uh, there's no reason to think that because the uh, recovery phase of the cycle uh, is going to be hot, that that should shorten the uh, duration of the cycle. Uh, we, you know, the, the parallel I've continually drawn is uh, the recovery after the uh, Volcker recession of 81, 82. Uh, that was a very rapid recovery. It didn't cause a lot of inflation. Uh, and that cycle went on for quite some time and really only ended when oil prices spiked around the uh, first Gulf War. So I don't think that we need to think uh, that uh, this is going to be a, a short economic cycle by any stretch. The, the lesson we're going to realize over the course of the next uh, 12 to uh, 24 months uh, is that maybe the Fed has changed its stripes to some degree in terms of its uh, reaction to inflation in the economy, uh, but the economy has not changed its stripes. Uh, it is still a low inflation economy that doesn't generate a lot of wage pressures. And for that reason, the Fed's going to be very gradual, and this will be another very long economic expansion. Carl, I think that's the issue right now. That's the debate that you've touched on. There are some people out there, as you pointed out, that joined me on the program earlier this morning talking about a shorter hotter cycle. And the reason I think they believe that is because cumulatively, maybe the rate of change, maybe things slow down. We get a deceleration of improvement over the year, and that's to be expected. But cumulatively, we will do so much to improve and recover from the labor market losses of last year that the Fed could find themselves behind the curve and need to hike more quickly. Why do you push back against that too, Carl? Well, I don't... Ultimately, for the Fed to find themselves behind the curve, they're going to have to see that inflation pressures are getting uh, away from them. And inflation pressures have not run in hot in the economy for uh, the better part of uh, 20 years. Uh, and certainly, above-trend growth could generate some short-term, I'll use the word, transitory uh, price pressures. But ultimately, what's going to determine if inflation is rising in the U.S. economy is workers' wages and the, the fundamental factors that are, are keeping a lid on workers' wages are globalization, which hasn't changed much, a little bit of tariffs here and there uh, that's not changing the globalization trade, uh, automation, uh, and a lack of unionization. Those trends are not changing. So while workers may have some bargaining power now, while there's a shortage of truckers and warehouse workers and what have you, uh, ultimately, we're going to get back to this dynamic where there's not a lot of wage pressure in the economy, and that's going to put the lid on inflation. Uh, and that brings me to another point that's been discussed here uh, in terms of the Fed being behind the curve. Uh, I don't think the Fed has even had the discussion yet uh, about which is going to come first, rate hikes or balance sheet unwind. And we confuse that with tapering. Tapering is still accommodation. It's just accommodation at a slower pace. When it ultimately comes time to tighten policy, uh, they can use either interest rate increases or yeah. shrinking the balance sheet. Uh, we've posed that question uh, to the chair, Powell, Vice Chair Clarida, Governor Brainerd, yesterday, uh, San Francisco President uh, Mary Daly, uh, no one is answering that question yet. And so while we might think in the last cycle uh, the Fed raised rates by 100 basis points before they started to shrink their balance sheet, uh, it doesn't appear that they're committed to that playbook this time around, which could mean that we start to see the balance sheet shrink first, not tapering, actual shrinkage. 
uh, not outright sales, just runoff. Uh, and that could push the Fed tightening even later into this expansion. I still think 2024 or 2025 uh, is going to be the time when the Fed starts raising interest rates. Cal, good to see you. As always, sure Carrick Donner of Bloomberg Economics. Looking at this market, it's been phenomenal. Equities have carried on charging through all-time highs. But this bond market, Katie, hmm. I think has caught everyone's eye this week. Yeah, it definitely has, John. Logic would suggest that better economic data upside surprises, more growth would mean higher Treasury yields. And instead, we've seen the exact opposite. Over the last two weeks, the 10-year Treasury yield down 13 basis points. We are sub 1.6%. And that really reveals that the market maybe had already priced in all that better data already after the sheer expectation of it led to a monster sell-off in the bond market in the first quarter. And of course, those growth expectations, not just on the economic front, but on the corporate earnings front, have been evident in the equity market too. What has driven equities higher really across the world, especially the more cyclically sensitive value plays like European equities and small caps is that narrative. They are each up more than 10% on a year-to-date basis. The Russell 2000 actually, as of yesterday's close, just about 1% from an all-time high. And when you look at the major U.S. benchmarks, the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ 100, they are all at records looking set for more come the opening bell. But here's the thing, John. The S&P 500, as of the closing bell on April 15th, sat at 41.70. The average analyst target for the index at year-end, December December 31st, 4,100. Not many people seeing upside from where we are right now. And again, it comes back to the question you asked at the top of the show, have been asking all week. Is all the good news already priced in? Can it really get better from here, John? Kelly Lyons, that is the debate right now, going into the open and bow with equities at all-time highs. I want to keep you on top of some news that's developing down in Washington, D.C. This coming from the team around the FX manipulator status coming from the U.S. Treasury. Here's a story from our team down in D.C. The United States refraining from designating any trading partner as a currency manipulator. This is the first foreign exchange policy report under the Biden administration, even though Switzerland, Taiwan, Vietnam actually met the thresholds for the label. So let me give you some detail around that. The Treasury Department saying today that those economies met the criteria under a 2015 law, which ties the label to certain economic criteria, but the administration said there was, quote, insufficient evidence to conclude that the trading partners showed the intent under a related 1988 law. I'll let you get your head around that. So that's the latest out of the story on the FX manipulator front down in Washington, D.C. Here's the latest out of Morgan Stanley, a close to $1 billion loss tied to Archegos and that blow up. A lot of talk about that. Morgan Stanley burned by that $911 million hit from the Archegos blow up of a month or so ago. Mr. Gorman over at Morgan Stanley saying that the family office disclosures need to be examined. I'm looking forward to catching up with Shanali Basak around the opening bow on this particular story, on the big banking story of the week so far from Morgan Stanley and others too. So let's get back to what we're talking about this morning, which is an equity market at all-time highs, and some people asking whether this is as good as it gets, or as Bank of America points out, whether a booming economy does translate into a booming market. Let's head over to PIMCO and catch up with Erin Brown for her response to that. Erin, great to catch up with you. Can you give me your response to that? Whether you do think these stellar economic numbers translate into stellar market performance through 21? I think that the market oftentimes does discount better economic data well in advance of the economic data actually coming out. So, you know, in, in, in a sense, the note is true and that oftentimes you see the market move well before you see the moves in the economic data. That said, I do think that over the next 12 months, while you know it will continue to be you know not a straight line up, I do think that the foundation is being built for a continuation of a very strong equity market as we move through the bulk of this year. You will see you know some rotation out of the sectors that have done well. You know, seen a lot of rotation year to date as well as at the back half of last year. That's going to continue, but we do think that the equity market will continue to rally through year end and at you know continue to end at all time highs. All time highs right now, Erin. And the number one question since the beginning of November right. has been where in the market do you want to own? And the number one answer has been you want the cyclical trade. That's stalled out. And Erin, we can go through it one by one. Ten year Treasury yields topping out end of March, mid caps topping out the small caps rather topping out the middle of March, the commodity story stalling out February, early March. Erin, where does the fuel come from to reignite that trade? We've seen, you know, clearly a really robust recovery 
in, in, in some ways unprecedented in the cyclical trade since the middle part of last year. I don't think the reflation story is dead at all. I think we're seeing really some consolidation right now and a pause, but it's likely to continue as we move through the first quarter earnings, which are coming out exceptionally strong already. And as we move through the bulk of the next couple of months and we continue to see economic data surprising to the upside, inflation, you know, continuing to look robust, I do think that you'll see the cyclical trade get a second leg of a leg legs and, and really rally, continue to rally, you know, keep in mind that so far year to date, we've really just seen the U.S. economic growth coming out much stronger than expected, but you haven't seen the same participation from, you know, global economic growth. As we start to see that come in as well, that's going to be more fuel to the fire for the cyclical trade. We have seen a rally abroad, though, particularly in Europe. So do you see it as justifying the move we've already seen or fueling the next leg of the trade? We've seen certainly the rally in the in the markets. We haven't seen the economic data, you know, certainly be, be as strong. Um, and and the U.S. has really been the leader in terms of economic growth. And I think the U.S. has been driving international performance rather than the other way around in terms of markets. I I do think that as you move to the second half of the year and you see broader vaccine distribution and more mobility data starting to pick up, not just in Europe, but in emerging markets as well, that's going to be a really powerful driver for the not just for the rest of the world, but also for the U.S. cyclical trade. Erin, always great to catch up with you. Stand bullish on this market and staying glued to that cyclical part of this market too. Erin, good to see you. Erin Brown there of PIMCO. Let's turn back to this market. As Erin pointed out, record high, record high, record high. And we've become desensitized to these numbers, haven't we? At the market desk with your movers. Here's Abby. John, well, we do, of course, have the last of the big banks reporting this morning, Morgan Stanley. And folks seem to be really uh, focused on that $911 million loss tied to the Archegos blow up because that stock is only up four tenths of one percent despite a huge top and bottom line beat otherwise a record quarter and they have now lost their top position as an equity trader on the equity trading platform to Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan because of that loss a little bit of shift there but overall green this of course as yields are now backing up too. turning to another form of the financials or crypto if you can call it that Coinbase Global wild ride continues had been lower earlier in the pre-market after actually closing down yesterday up 1.6 percent but if we take a look at some of the other bitcoin blockchain and crypto names we are going to see losses as you know john very frothy this year the big question is this a sell the news moment coinbase right now seeming to step away from that but let's watch as the day goes on john abby thank you coming up the economic recovery strengthening in china and elsewhere getting a boost from the consumer that conversation coming up next with pimco's erin brown and we'll catch up with ashish shah of Goldman Sachs Asset Management too. Looking forward to having the both of them comment on what is happening abroad from New York with futures up eight on the S&P. We advanced two tenths of 1%, a record high 41.70 on the S&P 500. This is Bloomberg. absolutely core to our business. Uh, it's uh, almost 20% of our franchise revenues uh, globally, uh, which is significantly more than most of our global peers uh, who are more in the mid-teens. We will invest in China, but also like, you know, we are also investing in the rest of Asia as well. Our top line growth uh, for the region has been um, close to 24% last year, you know, almost 20% of the group's revenue uh, as a percentage of the revenue of the group. So, uh, and this is where the group is counting on the growth. We see a company after a company, these are corporates committing to net zero. So um, pretty much across the board, there is an enthusiasm for putting capital to work to try to get us to a better carbon future. Credit Suisse has a fantastic brand name in Asia. We have obviously strong positions 
uh, in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong as our two main hubs, but uh, across across the region. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Right now, about half of U.S. households invest. We'd like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. It should just be something that people do. China is definitely slowing in its pace of growth, but I stress the word growth. China's GDP, if you look at it in index terms, is actually well above its pre-COVID um, recession level. And what that means is China's economy has now actually expanded beyond where it was. So while China certainly has done the early running and is now probably moderating a little bit, what a recovery. And that's the takeaway from J.P. Morgan's John Bilton on China. The continent showing signs of strength in the first quarter, with GDP climbing 18% from a year earlier and retail sales topping estimates in China. Bloomberg's Kelly Lyons joins us now for more. Morning, Kelly. Morning, John. Well, it is a V-shaped recovery in China, at least on the headline number. 18.3% growth, as you said. That was a record basically in line with estimates. And of course, that's mainly due to massive base effects because we're comparing it with the first quarter of 2020 in which the entire economy was shut down because of COVID. The other thing I would point out, John, is that yes, on a year-on-year -year basis, a huge number. On a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, though, not so much. It shows China's recovery is slowing. Growth down from about 3%, uh, more than 3%, last quarter on quarter now down to just six tenths of one percent but one encouraging sign is the fact that consumption picked up the recovery in china has really been led by infrastructure and real estate investment we've been waiting for consumers to gain traction and there are some signs of that finally starting to happen that was evident in retail sales which jumps 34.2 percent that beat expectations you did actually see industrial output rise by less than expected just 14.1 percent and and the country's growth is really still reliant on the property sector. So, John, the point of the story is the recovery is still uneven, but it is still a recovery. China is still growing. And, of course, this data comes alongside improving economic data here in the U.S., the two real growth engines of the global economy. And they are what is contributing to an uptick in what we're seeing in the Global Economic Surprise Index from Citi. And, of course, our own economists here at Bloomberg Economics, Economics say global growth is going to be 6.9% in 2021. And the two largest economies of the world, U.S. and China, are in the driver's seat on that, John. What a recovery in that country in China over the last 12 months. Katie, thank you. Joining us now on this story is Ashish Shah of Goldman Sachs Asset Management and still with us, I'm pleased to say, is PIMCO's Erin Brown. Ashish, the missing piece of this global economic recovery right now seems to be Europe, at least in terms of enthusiasm. China's recovered tremendously well. The United States is booming. Is Europe going to remain the missing piece in the year to come? No. So, John, you know, we think that Europe is going to be kind of the next leg that ends up dropping when it comes to global growth. And, and that represents an opportunity when it comes to global bonds because, uh, obviously, you know, the European bond market has kind of performed better than the U.S. bond market. And we think that that represents good relative value trades uh, for active investors in, in the bond market. Let's talk about those relative value trades in just a moment. Aaron, I just want your thought on this as well, whether Europe and an improvement there can be a source of upside surprises that ultimately leads to high yields worldwide. I do think that likely you will see Europe be the next leg of the trade. That said, you're certainly not going to see the same explosive growth out of Europe that you saw out of the U.S. or out of China. It's going to get better, um, certainly as we move through the second half of the year, and you do start to see more mobility data coming out that's stronger out of Europe and some of the lockdowns uh, that have been put in place even in the first quarter start to ease. That said, because they don't have the same powerful fiscal and monetary double engine support, you're certainly not going to see that same type of explosive growth that we saw in the latter half of the last year and even into this first quarter in the U.S. So better but moderate growth in Europe, relatively speaking, worse than what we're going to see in America because America's booming and recovery that's already mature over in China. Ashish, you talked about those relative trades. Can we talk about them right now? Where are they? I think that the U.S. is kind of priced 
for tremendous growth, you know, the, the growth that Aaron's talking about. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why you saw the rally this, this past week. I think when it comes to the global cyclical uh, 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 bond markets like Australia, Canada, that they have been pricing in a very optimistic outlook. And Europe just isn't isn't pricing in enough. I, I think that you could see a boom there um, and a boom that really impacts that bond market uh, on a go forward basis, just because people have been locked up more there. When you talk to the Europeans, um, they are desperate for travel. They're desperate to get out of their homes and where the US has been le much less compliant. And so our activity level has been much higher. So I, I, I think that that's the RV trade. You're supposed to be short Europe. You're supposed to be long the cycle including the, the U.S., which I think is uh, priced in way too much. So you both seem to be on the same page in terms of the macro theme. You've expressed how you would trade that. Erin, would you express it any differently? Really, I think the, the part of the curve that's going to where you're going to see that RV divergence is going to be sort of the belly of the curve, maybe out to five years. So the seven to 10 year part of the curve, I think probably the easiest and the cleanest way to play the trade is being long U.S. Uh, treasuries at sort of the belly of the curve and short bonds, that's likely going to be where that that convergence and the differentials in, in spread is likely to really predominate. Does that resonate with you, Ashish? Uh, absolutely. And some of that is already playing out as we speak. I, I think the other thing that is worth talking about here, John, is just the tremendous performance on the equity side and how you know, investors are getting longer and longer stocks. You know, this isn't going to be a straight line kind of game. There's going to be a surprise. There's going to be a shot. And I think it's really important for investors as we see these rallies, as volatility declines, to use that as an opportunity to rebalance their portfolios and make sure that they're they're kind of not getting lazy in their longs because there's going to be a shock here and you want to be able to have dry powder to be able to reinvest into uh, sell-offs that may be temporal, but like, you know, but will present tremendous opportunity. Ashish, final question from me then to you. Is that a cash position? I think I think you're supposed to be actually in core bonds, investment grade bonds. Interesting. Um, yeah, because I, I, I think when you look at the break-evens and you look at how much over cash you're earning, um, particularly with the steep curve, that it's really kind of tough to to make the argument for sitting at zero in, in the bank account. I think you're much better off having bonds and bonds are gonna protect you at these levels in, in any sort of growth slowdown or unexpected growth slowdown, which I think all of us have learned over the course of the last 14 months that you may think everything's gonna be fine, but you can't predict the future. None of us has crystal ball, and that's why you have bonds in your portfolio. I think we've all been humbled in many different ways, haven't we? Ashish Shah, it's good to see you, as Absolutely. always, from Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and to Erin Brown as well from PIMCO. Coming up, the analyst action you need to know. That'll be next in our morning calls. And later, Morgan Stanley rounding out a strong week of earnings, but announcing a $900 million dent tied to the Archegos blow-up. We're going to touch on that in a moment, and we'll catch up with BlackRock's Wei Lee and Michael Purvis of Tallbacken from New York City. That is Bloomberg.
Start your mornings with Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Extraordinary market day. This rally just keeps on going. But there is a tipping point. The business team you love to watch. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. Five minutes away from the opening bound in New York City this morning. Good morning to all. Equity futures up 11 on the S&P 500. 41.73 up by, let's call it a quarter of 1%. Let's get you some morning calls and look at some of the analyst action on Wall Street this morning. We begin, first up, with Argus upgrading United Airlines to a buy. $66 price target. The analyst expecting earnings to benefit from stabilizing fuel costs and strengthening air travel demand. Raymond James upgrading Comcast to outperform. The analyst saying that the reopening process should lift profits at the company's stores and theme parks. And finally, Wolf Research upgrading Cisco to an outperform. $63 price target. The analyst seeing a number of durable growth prospects with tailwind stemming the company's IT spending. That stock is up by around about one point. Two six percent. You're opening bows just around the corner. Record highs in America. This is Bloomberg. So Now is your online home for brand new Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. Discover new releases each week that include behind-the-scenes storytelling with conductors including music director Andres Nelsons, guest composers and musicians, plus critically acclaimed archival concerts and more. Visit bso.org forward slash now where the music plays on. BSO season sponsored by Bank of America. Markets never sleep, so stay connected with Francine Lacqua in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kaylee Lines in New York. Perspective on the day ahead. Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. Trading revenues coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. We're 25 seconds away from the opening bound in New York City, and we are heading towards a fourth straight week of gains on the S&P 500. Gains are piling up again this morning, up by a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Russell, up by a half of 1%. On the Nasdaq, up by two-tenths of 1%. There's your opening bound in New York. Surprise, surprise in the bond market this week. Switch up the board into the bond market we go. CPI higher than expected. Retail sales hotter than expected. 
and yields lower on the week, higher on the session by a basis point to 158.86, a break of 160 in yesterday's session. In the FX market, euro dollar up a little more than a tenth of 1%. We're getting close to 120, 119.85. And in the commodity market, holding on to a 63 handle, unchanged basically on WTI of $63 and about 40 cents. That's the cross asset story at the market desk with your movers. Here's Abby. Well, John, of course, one of the big stories this morning, big banks reporting, or at least one big bank, I should say, truly big bank, Morgan Stanley, putting up a very strong quarter, but it is stained, of course, by that $911 million loss tied to the Archegos blow up. Uh, that company is no longer the top equities trader on the street. Either that goes to Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. So the stock up ever so slightly. Now, State Street had been higher in the pre-market, now down ever so slightly. They put up a big beat on top and bottom line. Their AUM also topping $3.59 trillion under management. Just incredible. Higher than the estimate and uh, really pretty notable given the fact that the Fed's balance sheet is above $7 trillion. So State Street kind of ranks in there. Really amazing. PNC Financial up 2.4% a solid first quarter. They are resuming buybacks. Investors seem to like it. Now, where we have a really big gain, really helping out the S&P 500, Bank of America up 1.4%. They, of course, yesterday put up a solid quarter, but now they are joining the post-earnings bond frenzy with a six-part bond offering. Goldman Sachs, the top equity uh, trader on the street now, up seven-tenths of 1%. And then finally, yesterday's worst sector, energy, uh, not among the top, but it is higher, and some of the big names are up, even though oil is right around even at this point, John. Abby, thank you. About two minutes in then. Energy's doing okay. It's up four tenths of one percent. Bottom of the pile, information technology down almost a tenth of one percent. Top of the pile, materials up nine tenths of one percent. Financials up eight tenths of one percent. Let's stick on the banks. Morgan Stanley announcing an unexpected Archegos hit of a certain size, still in the spotlight from an otherwise record quarter. CEO James Gorman weighing in on the $900 million loss tied to the Archegos blow-up, saying the following, we're quite transparent about this. We don't like to take losses like this ever. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Shanali Bassett for more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. You know, you have a great quarter here at Morgan Stanley, beating so many expectations, taking a lot of questions on this earnings call about this Archegos hit. Of course, the loss itself came out bigger than a lot of Wall Street had expected here, but a lot of questions about risk management, why Morgan Stanley was the one to take the loss rather than Goldman Sachs, which also had some exposure to this, uh, this client, Archegos. Uh, the answers we're getting so far is that the family office business at Morgan Stanley is less than 10% of its prime brokerage business. But James Gorman still says there needs to be more disclosure by means of the SEC about this type of client. Uh, as far as Archegos goes, Morgan Stanley was known to be the largest prime brokerage to that client, whereas we know there are many other banks that didn't have them as a client at all. Beyond that, uh, we did see major jumps at its fixed income trading business, a business that, you know, years ago would not have broken $2 billion, now well over $2 billion. And had they not had this Archegos hit, they would have still been the largest equities trader on Wall Street. So we will see where that goes from here. Shanali, what a long week it's been covering these banks. <laughs> a busy week for you. What's the takeaway? Uh, well, one more thing for you, John, just because this is unique to Morgan Stanley. E-Trade, right? That their, their retail trading boom really benefiting from that. Interestingly, it's not just about day traders. They're seeing a lot of room to run there in their financial advisory networks, which means everybody's big push into wealth seems to be paying off when it comes to the stock market. Shanali, stay close. If you hear anything else, bring it to us right here on Bloomberg. Let's bring in tall backers Michael Purvis and BlackRock's Wei Lee. And what a week it's been in this market. Wait, can we just begin with the banks and the financials, which has delivered some record numbers. And the rally we've seen in the cyclical parts of this market, I think, has really dominated this show over the last week. That rally stalled a little bit. Can it continue? Can it pick up again? Um, our view going into the second quarter, as we navigate the second quarter, is that the magnitude of this very powerful reopening is still somewhat underappreciated. And as a result of that, we think that cyclical tilt, cyclical uh, trade, there definitely is more to go. So, uh, John, you talked about banks' earnings. We have some incredible eye-watering numbers coming through. Uh, but when you compare 
kind of versus the very low levels last year, and you end up with numbers like 100% EPS year-on-year -year growth, you have to question, does that matter, right? Like, we obviously want to look forward rather than looking backwards. And when we look at uh, kind of forward-looking, it's really around kind of the impact of tax. Uh, if companies are comfortable kind of guiding, uh, offering forward guidance that we care more rather than the bad work looking earnings, which, which are important, but the forward piece is more important. But uh, uh, just to tie everything back together ahead of a very strong quarter of uh, macro and micro numbers coming through, we do not want to kind of lower our pro-risk view, which is why we are still uh, very constructive on risk as we kind of navigate this second quarter. The way I want to pick up on that word you used, underappreciated. That's the debate right now. Is this overly appreciated, fully priced, or underappreciated? It's amazing we're all looking at the same numbers and have completely different views on that. Michael Purvis, your view, is it still underappreciated? Look, I, I think the, uh, the large bank sector um, is still underappreciated. I think there's a, there's a view that, um, you know, in an expensive, many facets of this market are very expensive. Look at Bank of America, it's trading, you know, 15 and a half times forward earnings a healthy discount to the market. I think you have to be honest with the fact that, at least my view, is that the yield curve is not going to keep expanding the way it has been uh, there. But the fundamentals, are, I think, are really pretty sound. You saw across the, the large banks a, a very, uh, you know, these plentiful um, uh, loan loss reserves boosting earnings. We could probably expect that to continue as the recovery continues there. And it's a good solid company um, that's priced fairly in an expensive, uh, in many respects is an expensive overall market. So I think that's gonna keep, uh, I, I think you're gonna keep seeing this thing, uh, these big banks grind higher. You both seem to be on a similar page. Here's the view from Bank of America. They put out in their report this morning something that they've said repeatedly over the last several weeks. Our 2021 EPS forecast is now above consensus, but euphoric sentiment and lofty valuations leave us cautious on the S&P 500. Now, Wei Li, when you come on this program and say things like it's underappreciated, I know there's a lot of homework that's been done behind those words that you use. It's not just a feeling. You don't just look at the market and say it's underappreciated. Can you just give us some clarity on the process you go through, the things you're looking at specifically that say, to you at least, this is an underappreciated move? Um, first, I would just observe the fact that as we go into data releases like the CPI, like the retail sales, the fact that the actual number are coming in stronger than the consensus, that speaks to me that markets are, well, at least uh, forecasters are not quite kind of uh, catching up with just how powerful the magnitude of the reopening is. And within uh, BlackRock, we spend a lot of time kind of building out the macro framework, looking at both kind of the, the, the data, but also social listening in terms of uh, how much of that is uh, is uh, is being reflected in the in the in the numbers that, uh, that the forecasters are putting out there and bringing everything together while we actually have been saying for a while uh, as we go into uh, the second quarter that this pop in reopening is underappreciated and, and obviously right now markets are catching up uh, more and more but uh, there is still room uh, for, for, for for that to come through and if you look at this second quarter GDP growth can easily hit above 10 percent which uh, is um, I think is still somewhat still above consensus here so so, so that's why we think that it's, uh, it's 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 powerful it's underappreciated and and given the very synchronized nature of kind of the pent-up demand getting released at the same time across all income cohorts it's really really powerful the likes of which we have not seen for a very very long time wait just to follow up do you think it's economists that underappreciate this or markets? Well, actually, that's an important distinction, right? And, and this ties back to your earlier observation that this is a week of data that, that has been very, very uh, strong. But at the same time, when you look at how bond markets have been reacting, rates have been reacting, they have not really kind of gone up in response to, 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 to strong data. So it would appear that at least earlier on, uh, in terms of bond market uh, positioning and pricing, there was uh, expectation for the, the, the growth number to come through quite strongly. So, so, so I absolutely agree with you. This, uh, this, this 
distinction between kind of forecasters, economists, and also market positioning. But one more thing I would say around sure. kind of the rate reaction to strong market uh, data is that it really goes to show liquidity is back in the driving uh, driver's seat. So we have this week equities and bonds rallying at the same time. It would appear that really kind of liquidity pushing up all boats, not just kind of stimulus uh, in the system, very, very powerful, but also if you think about rising bank reserves in response to TGA drawdown, and all of that are, are playing a factor here as well. You and I will continue the conversation. Michael Purvis, just wanted to give you a final word on the bond market and the price action we've seen this week. What is your take? My take on the bond market here is that the pricing we saw yesterday um, it speaks to consolidation, and I actually think we may even see lower 10-year yields. And I think my key message here is, is that I think the 10-year, the back end of the curve was really at a pivot point. The, the drive higher in yields over the, since last summer has been driven by short-term inflation hikes driving up near-term rate, uh, rate hiking expectations. Um, with Powell reasserting his message at the last FOMC, I think we're looking at now a landscape where the back end, uh, the further dated inflation expectations really have to do heavy lifting and fight this uh, sort of gap closing that's sort of inevitable between what the money markets are suggesting, what Powell's suggesting. We don't know how that gap's going to close, but it will close somehow. Um, and so I think I think what you may well see is, is the 10-year yield continuing to sort of consolidate in this range because the back end inflation story is really so speculative, um, and the and the short term inflation story so so is already priced in. Um, with that being said, I do think that you can still see cyclical outperformance even if the ten year yield continues to hover in the range it's in, or even at a lower range. Um, so I think that's where one of those things where if you see the Russell SPX pair overlaid with the 10-year yield, you may see that that classic correlation set for some big decoupling because I agree with the Wei Li, we, we're going to continue to see, you know, strong growth throughout the balance of the year and into next year. I just don't know if the 10-year yield or the 30-year yield have to keep going higher because of that. Mike, good to see you. As always, Michael Purvis, the tall back, and Wei Li will be sticking with us. Let's head to the market desk and get you a look at this market at a record high. Here's Abby. Record highs indeed, John, and a piece of it has to do with the home building sector. If we take a look at some of the home builders, we are going to see some nice gains because, of course, housing starts with the month, month of March absolutely soared. This after a relatively slow winter, but the housing starts the highest since 2006, 1.74 million. This, of course, uh, in the beginning of spring, going into uh, the summer, suggesting that some strength could be ahead. So Lennar, DR Horton, Toll Brothers, higher for a second day. Turning, of course, to some of the big earnings movers. We're just talking about Morgan Stanley. Oh, wow, it's actually flipped slightly lower. This, of course, is investors are focusing on that $900 million Archegos loss. Uh, instead of the very strong beat otherwise, let's see how it plays out during the day. PPG industry, this is why the materials sector is the top sector. This materials uh, company put up a very strong quarter, soaring up 11%. Alcoa also put up a big beat. This is aluminum prices are uh, really climbing. And then finally, J.B. Hunt, another strong quarter for the trunking company. Lots of price targets raised on the street and overall record highs, John, and most sectors higher. Tech is the only one down. It's amazing because you have that 10-year yield up just a little bit, but pressuring tech. Abby, thank you. Good to catch up. As always, Morgan Stanley year today has been flying. Coming into today, that stock has been all over the place. Year today, up 17.58%, and that's still some way off the likes of Goldman, Wows, who have had massive quarters. Coming up, 3.35 million vaccinations a day on average in the United States of America. 198 million doses in total. What an effort. More on that story next. From New York with equities at or close to all-time highs through much of this week. 41.80 on the S&P 500, up a quarter of 1%. This is Bloomberg.
that Norway sells way more electric cars per capita than the U.S.? Norway. <laughs> well, I won't stand for it. In this neighborhood just outside Oslo, the majority of cars are electric. Last year, Norway became the first country in the world to sell more electric cars than any other. In December, EV market share was at 67%. In 2025, the country wants all cars sold to be zero emission. Hey, Norway, listen up, you fish-loving! Hmm. This place is adorable. Damn it! But why is Norway leading this development? The country is rocky, it's ice cold, and with huge distances. The easy answer is politics. By giving the consumers benefits that pay off, more people will go electric when they're getting a new car. These perks could be no VAT when buying the car, reduced tolls, the possibility to drive in the bus lane, and quite a bit of free parking as well. 2021 is an election year in Norway, and the climate and environment minister Sveinung Rotevatn believe the EV perks will be a hot topic in the campaigns, where removal of the perks is said to be a central issue. So there were two reasons to do it. One, out of an abundance of caution to, re to see what we're dealing with, and B, to make sure they alert physicians about what to do with it. Hopefully, we'll get a decision quite soon as to whether or not we can get back on track with this very effective vaccine. It has been one of the stories of this week. 75 million fully vaccinated Americans allowing the United States to stay cautious in its rollout of J&J's vaccine. The EU taking a similar approach with French officials focusing on a number of different options. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. Yeah, John, it's been a slew of different news, right? Yesterday, we got the headlines that France had reached deaths of 100,000 from COVID-19. China then, of course, planning to approve some foreign vaccines. We also had a story that they don't have that mRNA technology, and so the efficacy levels there are a little bit lower. And then, of course, as you were hitting really the news of the week, the EU may not renew the Astra and the J&J &J vaccines. And it really does follow a lot of the bigger pause that we're thinking might last a lot longer here in the U.S. as it relates to that J&J &J vaccine as well. If you flip up the board, you talked about the numbers, right, of how many vaccines we have. Israel, frankly, John, crushing it. Half their population fully vaccinated. Your U.K., look at that. You're next. Half your population has at least one dose. The U.S. comes in third, about 30% fully vaccinated, and then you round out that 50% with at least one dose. Mainland Europe, though, John, just continuing to struggle as they figure out the J&J, &J, the AstraZeneca issues, the import-export manufacturing issues that they continue to see. Finally, though, I mean, we have to talk about the reopening trade and how it relates back to these markets. You had the Russell 2000, the big outperformer, the last three days. You're up three straight days in a row, the highest since April 5th. Your record there is a 2360, and then what that means for travel. 1.49 million travelers going through that TSA uh, turnstiles, if you will. That is nearing the uh, highest now since March 15th, 2020. We are climbing our way slowly back to where we were. Slowly, slowly, slowly. We're getting there, Taylor. Looking forward to the coverage going into the weekend from you and the team a little bit later. Taylor Riggs there. On the latest in this economy, in this vaccination effort, here's the latest from... Draghi, almost said President Draghi of the ECB, Prime Minister Draghi now, of course, confirming Italy will start reopening on April 26th. Now, I think what I want to talk about now is what's been happening in the commodity market. Crude is up this year by about 30 percentage points, but that rally stalled out in early March. Copper is up this year by about 19 percentage points, but in a similar way, at a similar time, that rally stalled out as well. 
And at one point earlier this year, we were talking about a new commodity super cycle, everything coming together, and the prices of all of these commodities absolutely surging in the same way they did coming out of the last financial crisis, at least for a couple of years, off the back of China's big push. I'm going to bring in BlackRock's Wei Li on this for a final thought. Wei, I have to say, you and the team put out a really interesting note in your weekly commentary on commodities and why this super cycle story needs to be thought with a little bit more nuance. Can you run me through the latest thinking of you and the team? Well, uh, John, exactly as you said, year-to-date uh, commodities have broadly done quite well, even though momentum started stalling a little bit uh, more recently. And in our analysis, there are two very powerful forces kind of impacting the commodity space. Uh, on the one hand, you have the very powerful reopening that we uh, spoke to, and that is lifting all boats almost. You talked about oil, you talked about uh, you talked about copper, you talked about other industrial metals, uh, and the, the second force is a bit more selective. And here we're talking about kind of the longer term structural global green transition. And here we're talking about uh, beneficiaries of that, uh, including copper, nickel, lithium, for example, but not across the board, because uh, in all likelihood, we're looking at a departure from kind of uh, oil uh, as main energy source to potentially alternative energy sources. So as the two forces uh, interact, right in the middle of this reopening, uh, I think we have to kind of differentiate the near-term drivers versus the longer-term drivers. Uh, and obviously, with the longer-term drivers, uh, there is more room uh, to go. And we think that the recent kind of consolidation presents interesting uh, opportunities there. Can you just touch on one of those opportunities right now, Wei Li? Where is the big one for you? Um, oh, within commodities, yeah. if you think about uh, copper uh, supply demand, really in favor for the longer term uh, for the longer term trend, uh, especially given the lack of investment in the past. And now looking ahead, demand likely to come through in a very very meaningful way, not only from kind of the in industrial space, but also from the EV, the the, the the power charging space, and all of that paints a picture of supply demand being very in favor of uh, of copper going forward. But if you think about kind of the recent price action, there were some technical factors around this stocking that has been uh, coming into play and also speculative positioning lessening as well. But from here on, we could see a, a cleaner slay for, for this, uh, for this uh, exposure to perform over uh, the longer term because of our commitment and the conviction in the global green transition. Wei Li of BlackRock, it's good to catch up. Come back soon. Thank you very much. Wei Li of BlackRock there on the commodity market. I want to turn back to the sector price action. Just been record high after record high in this equity market. Here's Abby for more. Not surprisingly, with those record highs, John, we do have a modestly risk on sector composition. If we go into the Bloomberg and use the IMAP, we will see most sectors are climbing. So investors clearly wanting in on stocks. Now, making it a bit more risk on the fact that you have the cyclical sectors, some of them up top, materials up 1.1%, financials up almost six tenths of 1%. On the bottom of the pile, it's interesting, energy now there once again, tech also slightly slightly lower and communication services down a little bit. On the week, this is super interesting, John, because I bet you would think I would want to talk about the banks or technology, but not so much. Utilities, real estate, and healthcare, these are among the top sectors this week, and it has everything to do with yields falling, that 10-year yield on the week, the most since December 11th, giving up right now eight basis points. So it makes those dividend-rich stocks look really great on the week. Abby, thank you. Coming up, we'll bring you the trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg. enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line.
compare financials, find people, analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Countries that entered this crisis with limited fiscal space, with more vulnerabilities, need to be supported for the benefit of the world. The transparency of the debt burden for the poorest countries needs to be increased. There needs to be fuller disclosure. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. Five minutes into the session in the United States of America, we grind towards a fourth straight week of gains on the S&P 500. Looking okay, sitting pretty at all-time highs on the S&P at 41.72. That's the story on the S&P for the Nasdaq, down about four tenths of one percent. Outperformance on the week coming into today relative to the small caps, but a little bit softer, lighter, lower on the Nasdaq 100 today. Let's get to the trading diary. What you need to be watching for the rest of today into next week: the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey, top of the hour. President Biden with the Prime Minister of Japan at the White House later this afternoon. Tuesday, Apple unveiling its latest products, plus Netflix reporting earnings after the close. ECB rate decision on Thursday, plus earnings from American and Southwest Airlines too. Coming up a little bit later, great lineup on Bloomberg Real Yield if you can make it for that. If you can't, have an awesome weekend. Been good to catch up. Catch me on Twitter for more at Ferro TV. This is Bloomberg. minority myth wasn't something that was fabricated by the Asian Americans. It was created as a tool to alienate the Black and the Asian American communities, and it was incredibly successful. We know the racism didn't begin yesterday. We know it's probably not going to end tomorrow, but it is our job to make sure that there's progress and we keep people safe, give people dignity. And I spent a lot of time last year to just listen, to understand, to reflect and understand what I could do as, as a leader of this organization. For many years, we've been very shareholder focused, and now there really is much more of a community requirement. The economic downturn in the U.S., we're seeing unemployment and income losses affecting women more than men. Two-thirds of the jobs lost in South Africa were women's jobs. So I think we're in a moment of crisis. Clearly, our societies are reproducing, not producing inequality. We need better public policy and we need companies to step up. We're early on in this year. I know we've already sort of penciled in 6 or 7% growth and a big fall in unemployment. But under outcome-based policy, we really want to see that. I'm bullish on the rebound, but I know we have a long way to go before the job is complete. There's no textbook for this. You don't want to be too preemptive, but I also don't want to be so... Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to play stop on profit for Euro. And we're going to play... 80... Point nine. Okay, just right here. Eighty point nine. Uh, you need to play stop on profit. Don't play hero. So uh, it's better to have some profit, uh, end up in profit, than end up with losses. Okay. So stop on profit placed. In our case, we have two pips. 
So um, we will have 200 pounds in profit if it will uh, be filled. Uh, if not, we will move on. In your case, it's all about how much broker pays you. So you need it before you enter trade. You always have to check uh, how much you spend if you trade on margin and how much you will get for one pip. This way it will be easier to calculate 10 pips, 15 pips, okay? Speak to you later and stay safe. And uh, we will see how far it will go. Probably it will feel right now this second, yeah. Position closed. Position closed and we have 200 pounds. Okay, good, good trade. Let's wait for another trading opportunity. Stay safe. Robert Anderson is a Puerto Rico resident of four years. The eye of the storm came in south of El Yunque, swept up towards San Juan and out to Arecibo. Everything on the right-hand side is what we call the dirty side of the storm. This isn't his first time in a disaster zone. With a military and telecom background, Anderson worked on repairing damaged cell phone towers in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Some might be tempted to label him a disaster capitalist, seeking lucrative government contracts for his expertise. But as Anderson finds himself in the middle of a humanitarian crisis, he and his associates are developing a variety of pro bono recovery projects that target the island's hardest hit areas. I see two Puerto Ricos. We're here in San Juan, they have telecommunications restored. They may or may not have power, but basic services are in place. They're able to get food, they're able to buy things. They're surviving. And when you look outside of the San Juan area, you can go 15 minutes from here and find areas that are devastated. I'm working on the devastated side. Today, he's put together a boots on the ground mission to provide medical care to some of the island's most isolated and vulnerable residents. Steve Berenbaum is one of Anderson's business associates. He offered an extra car and a set of hands. So we received an initial report from a nurse that was out in the area. We're headed to the northeast region of Utuado for some people that are in need of urgent medical assistance. Dr. Sally Priester is a physician from San Juan. She filled a van with medical supplies at her own expense and brought along a team of nurses. Google Maps estimated our first destination to be a 90-minute drive. But it didn't account for obstacles like this. First stop was the home of an 82-year-old blind Vietnam veteran. His roof was blown off by the storm, and he's been living alone in a back shed for nearly two months. His cane actually got broken in the storm, um, so he's limited mobility. He has a number of medical ailments. Dr. Priester's having a look at him. We called the VA. They're going to get him set up with what he needs, get him stabilized, so he can then be transported either to an evacuation center or off the island. It's when the chain gets broken, when those, when those families that are connected to them leave the island or yeah. take off. These guys get left at the end of the road, yeah. and um, it's, it's tough. FEMA was not officially part of Robert's team, and their arrival caught everyone by surprise. Their job here was to survey and report back to their superiors and did not come with medical aid of any kind. People think that FEMA is there to hand out bottles of water. It's not what they do. FEMA has a role to play. They have a very specific role. They bring in ships, they bring in airplanes, they bring in tractor trailers with pallets of things. But they're a big machine, um, and there's gaps in that thing. And you're seeing one of the gaps here, and we help fill that role. These guys are in a bad situation before, and now they're struggling for real basic things. One of the risks that you run is people going from fear to hopelessness. Uh, those are the folks that we're trying to reach. And how are they reached? How are they even found? Word of mouth, mostly. And what's your role in all this? Um, ghost in the machine. I'm lucky enough to be able to communicate with folks in FEMA, the uh, state of Puerto Rico. For a ghost, Robert makes his presence well known. Not only was he the de facto leader of the mission, now with FEMA in tow, he created his own maps to survey storm damage. So we're uh, right here. And delivered them to FEMA HQ free of charge. I have pretty good reach. Perhaps that's how he managed to earn himself a coveted FEMA badge without actually working for them. 
And it's these relationships that allow him to operate more efficiently than an NGO or a government agency. We're able to resolve problems at a different level. Our next stop was on a mountaintop, a family of 11 struggling to care for their special needs brother in what was left of their house. Probably we are the first uh, health team uh, to come and visit this family. Muy bien, todo muy bien. The patient has a uh, Down syndrome, he is all day in bed. The difficulty with this is the patient cannot be alone. The most important thing is that you need to take care of the chronic disease besides disability because they have been not going to a doctor and no doctor has come in here yet. So we need a refill of this medication. After maybe 54 days, it's not getting better. And the only way that you can be able to see that is coming to the ground, drive, and see the people and talk to the people. You can see San Juan from here, but you can't get there. It's like the Emerald City. On this stop, we caught word that a man living alone at the edge of the jungle was in need of care. So we decided to take a little detour, come up here and check out and see what's going on. One of the challenges is to find those people that are at the end of these roads that need help. Pero por qué estás solo? Por qué estás por acá tan solo? I'm asking about uh, why he's alone right here. He said things of life happens, you know, I'm here, by myself. This is not a job. To do this, you need to have passion for what you can do. You're not going to get paid. It said in disaster response and emergency response that the real first responders are your neighbors. You don't need to wait for a lucrative FEMA contract to go out and, and do good and to help the community. In the end, do you feel like you're making a difference? The lives you touch and people that you can affect, I don't really think about it in those terms. But why do you do it? It helps me sleep at night. Um, I think it's as much for the people that are going out to help and do things that it is for the people that you affect. Whether out of altruism, or the lure of a paid gig, or some mixture of the two, Anderson hopes to stay here to help shape Puerto Rico's future. Puerto Rico's essentially been a colony for 400 years. It was treated poorly by the Spanish. It was not treated well by the United States when they first got here. Puerto Rico can continue in the way that it's always been, or Puerto Rico can rebuild itself like nothing that's ever been. And we have to do everything we can to make that real. That's the bottom line.